tracking government spending from the stimulus bill. The House Oversight Committee, looking at how stimulus funds are being spent, today heard from the GAO, representatives of the Departments of Education and Transportation, and from the head of the board that oversees stimulus spending. This is a little less than four hours. ...plan to jumpstart our economy. Heal the hemorrhaging, labor market, prevent drastic cuts in state budgets, and provide much-needed assistance to our nation's working families. With nearly $790 billion in taxpayers' money on the line, the Recovery Act mandated extraordinary accountability and transparency provisions. Among these requirements, Section 1512 of the Act obligates recipients to report on the use of certain recovery funds. On October 30th, the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board, Recovery Board, released their first recipient reports. And today, the GAO will release its first report analyzing the reporting process and the results. The recipient's report indicate that the Recovery Act has directly created or saved approximately 640,000 jobs and about 400,000 of those jobs are in education or construction. In my home state of New York, 40,000 jobs reportedly have been created or saved by Recovery Act funding. And in New York City, job placement in the third quarter were up 60 percent from last year with 3,043 jobs placement in Brooklyn alone. In downtown Brooklyn, the long stall revitalization project, City Point, has been resurrected and will generate more than 300 construction jobs and 100 permanent jobs. Additionally, Recovery Act funds are being used to build nearly 740 affordable homes in Harlem and Brooklyn, generating 2,800 new jobs. While stories like this are very encouraging, I am gravely concerned that the unemployment rate is now 10.2 percent, the highest in 26 years. It is, it is even, <clears throat> excuse me, it is even higher for African Americans and Hispanic Americans, for people who have lost their jobs. It is not very comforting uh, to say we are making progress. Uh, nevertheless, the experts tell us that unemployment recovery historically lags behind economic recovery. According to Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, if the stimulus package did not exist, our nation's unemployment situation would be far worse. And on the positive side, in the third quarter of this year, we saw the first growth in GDP in over a year. That being said, today's hearing confronts the question, how do we know the Recovery Act is really working? The truth of the matter is that while recipients report, reports provided for an unprecedented level, uh, unprecedented level of transparency, we must be able to rely on the reported data. At this point, it is clear that errors found by GAO and others should be corrected immediately. Not months later, not, no matter how difficult, recipient reporting should be subject to strict quality control. The American taxpayer expects reporting to be done and done well. And $787 billion weighing in the balance is certainly far from just general pocket change. Taken as a whole, the big picture seems to indicate that the job trend is positive. Overall, there are some signs that jobs are finally being created, both as a direct and indirect result of Recovery Act spending. But while we are on the brink of recovery, we have a long way to go. The important message that I get from these recipient reports is that we need to sp spend Recovery Act money on projects that actually create jobs. We need to get the money out there faster, and we need to make sure it is targeted on economically in to economically distressed areas. And we certainly need to make sure it is properly accounted for. I'm looking forward uh, today to, to assurance from our witnesses that there is a sense of urgency 
to do that. In addition, I think the Congress working with, I think the Congress working with the President really needs to focus on the need for further job creation over the next several weeks. The American people are really hurting. And again, I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to your testimony. At this time, I yield five minutes to the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank all the members of the administration for being here. I want to first preface by saying that uh, recovery.gov is the right idea in reportability. It's a new idea, and there are going to be bugs. I think we all recognize that it we're not going to get it right the first time, but we can and must continue to make transparency in government not just a goal, but a reality. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased that we have a panel of witnesses before us today who can answer questions about why, passage, why after the passage of $787 billion stimulus, uh, substantial job creation has not occurred, and why members of the administration are peddling false save jobs created. You yourself used the 640,000 jobs created number, a number that is still on the board even though it has been discredited by both public and private sources. The American people, Mr. Chairman, are suffering. We learned this month that another 190,000 people joined the ranks of the unemployed, bringing the total number of jobs lost since President Obama took office to 3.8 million jobs, or 10.2 percent of the workforce. If you're that 10.2 percent or an African American and a 15 percent unemployment or an African American youth and a 50 percent unemployment, it's 100 percent unemployment to you. We, are re <clears throat> we, we all remember, Mr. President, the stimulus pitch, a promise that unemployment would never rise above 7.8 percent and the stimulus would save 3.5 to 4 million jobs. By the President's own metrics, this policy has been an object failure. Vice President Biden, who is responsible, has in fact been the chief misread reader of the economy by his own statements. If he had ever met with the Chairman and myself on this issue, we certainly would have told him that in fact we needed to work more closely together and we needed not to predict these numbers without science. Then the same economists that misread the economy are creating a, pol a policy of miscalculation of what to do next. And steps in the, in the recovery will clearly be in the wrong direction. The administration continues to misread the economy and misunderstand the nature of economic growth. They also continue to mislead the American people with the faulty jobs claims that missed the steps that the country needed for an economic recovery. The, the administration continues to rely on the discredited economic theory that puts misplaced belief in government spending on pet projects, and in this case, taking credit for jobs saved that are substantially government jobs. School teachers are important, federal workers are important, but that's really where this has gone rather than to the economic growth that this country is, is famous for. Unfortunately, the main thing about the stimulation of the policy is, in fact, the size of government. Reports indicate that over half the jobs claimed so far have been in the public sector. The federal government uh, stands to grow by 140,000 permanent jobs by 2010. Clearly, the federal government is not feeling pain. Unemployment here in the nation's capital is 4 percent. And we have to keep in mind that taxpayers' money is, in fact, by definition, always being wasted in government programs. We try to keep it to a minimum. Clearly, it happens. If our stimulus had been one in which we allowed the American people to make their own determinations and simply supported them in that through investment tax credits and other systems that have historically worked, we would be only having the IRS making sure they truthfully made the investments. We wouldn't be trying to figure out whether where the California 99th Congressional District is which, by the way, I hope it's a Republican district. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps most relevant in today's hearing is the fact that the administration continues to try to cover up its mistakes with misleading job claims. Recovery.gov currently proclaims 640,000 to 329 jobs have been created or saved by the stimulus. Well, the administration's continued to brag about, brag about this number as a fact 
Reports have indicated that it's wildly inaccurate. The whole jobs created saves metrics is not only troubled, it is entirely deceitful. No government agency, private sector group, or research economics has any idea what the reliable calculation track for these numbers would be. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put up at this time the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of propaganda. Propaganda, a noun. Information especially of a biased or misleading nature used to promote a political cause or point of view. Mr. Chairman, it is very clear today, not by the witnesses here, not by, in fact, recovery.gov directly, but by how this is being treated, how these jobs are being continued to be claimed, and how, in fact, we are dealing with 3.8 million lost jobs, and yet we are told to focus on the 640,000 saved jobs and how much worse it would be. Mr. Chairman, that is propaganda, plain and clear. The administration has to go back to the facts. As I said in my first part of my opening statement, I support the work of recovery.gov trying to bring the facts to us and recognize there will be mistakes, but the fact is they have no idea how many jobs have been saved or created. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Um, now we move to our witnesses. Mr. Earl Devaney is the chairman of the Recovery, Accountability, and Transparency Board. Some people refer to it as RAT. Uh, I, I'm not going to call it RAT. Uh, of course, um, uh, which is the body created by the Recovery Act to ensure transparency in the use of recovery funds and prevent the waste, fraud, and abuse of those taxpayer dollars. Prior to being named as chairman of the Recovery Board, Mr. Devaney served as the Inspector General of the Department of the Interior. Mr. Devaney has also served as the Director of the Office of Criminal Enforcement, Forensic and Training for the Environmental Protection Agency, and as an officer in the Secret Service. Welcome, Mr. Devaney. Look Thank you, forward Mr. To your testimony. Mr. Gene Dodaro is the Acting Comptroller General of the Government Accountability Office. Mr. Dodaro has held this position since March the 13th, 2008. Mr. Dodaro's career is well seasoned, spanning over 30 years of service at GAO. Over the course of the last nine years, Mr. Dodaro has held a number of key senior level positions, including Chief Operating Officer and Head of the GAO's Accounting and Information Management Division. Welcome, Mr. Dodaro. But the Honorable John Pocari is the Deputy Secretary of Transportation and is responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operations of the Department. Previously, Mr. Pocari served as Secretary of Maryland's Department of Transportation and was Assistant Secretary of Economic Development Policy at the Maryland Department of Business and Economic Development. Welcome. Mr. Pocari. The Honorable Wilder Miller was confirmed in July as the Deputy Secretary of Education. Uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of Education. And Mr. Miller serves as the Department's Chief Operating Officer. Deputy Secretary Miller has previously worked with the Los Angeles Unified School District, the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, and serve as an ex officio member of the Board of Education for the City of Los Angeles Budget and Finance Committee. We welcome you to uh, this hearing today. Uh, as long-standing procedure, we always swear our witnesses in. So if you would be kind enough to stand and raise your right hand. You agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. You may be seated. So why don't we just go right down the line? We start with you, Mr. Dodaro, and just come right down the line. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to you, Ranking Member Ice, uh, members of the uh, committee. I'm very pleased to be here today to have the opportunity to talk about GAO's views and suggestions regarding 
the first set of recipient reports filed under the Recovery Act. Given the national scope of this activity and a relatively limited time frame to stand up the original reporting system, we think it was a good uh, first start. However, there are a number of significant data quality uh, and reporting issues that must be addressed. Uh, based on our initial analysis, for example, of the uh, database that was released on October 30th, uh, we found that there were some uh, erroneous or questionable uh, information uh, in the database that merits additional scrutiny. Uh, for example, we found about 4,000 reports that uh, had no money expended uh, but yet claimed over 50,000 FTEs that had been reported. There are other reports where money has been expended uh, but the, uh, um, no FTEs have been reported uh, under those reports. So this needs additional scrutiny and examination to determine uh, the validity of that information. Uh, secondly, the coverage, uh, OMB estimates that about 90 percent of the recipients reported, but questions remain about the remaining 10 percent of the recipients that uh, should have reported uh, but potentially uh, did not. There's also questions about the quality of the review uh, that was done by federal uh, departments and agencies and by prime recipients. While over 75 percent of the reports were reviewed by federal agencies, uh, close to one in five uh, were not, uh, and far fewer reviews were done and documented in the system by the prime recipients, and so that needs further inquiry uh, and investigation as well. Uh, another uh, problem that we identified, and this was a, a, a fairly significant one, dealt with the different interpretations of full-time equivalent positions that were due to be reported. There was a lot of inconsistent application uh, regarding this, especially as it related to the time period in which people made the calculations. Uh, this area uh, because of the different interpretation, really compromises the ability to aggregate the information uh, across the recipient reports. Now, we made a series of recommendations to OMB to work with uh, the Recovery Board and federal departments and agencies. Uh, first is to clarify and standardize the definition of full-time equivalent positions and set a standard period of measurement so the information can be collected and accumulated uh, consistently and, and, and properly. Also to be clearer in the guidance about the fact that the reporting focuses on hours worked uh, that need to be uh, reported in a consistent manner. We also believe that given the issues that we and others have identified that OMB should work with the federal agency establishment and with the prime recipients to review lessons learned under this first reporting uh, exercise and reevaluate their quality assurance uh, and reporting approaches uh, to make necessary modifications uh, to ensure that these data quality and reporting issues are addressed uh, successfully. Uh, because this is a, a cumulative reporting uh, approach uh, and GAO is required to review each of the quarterly reports that are filed by the recipients acts, we will be following up uh, on this, conducting additional analysis and making uh, further reports to this committee and to the Congress regarding the extent to which these data quality and reporting issues are addressed. I think it's important to address these issues both for the current set of recipients that are filing reports, but also there will be new recipients that were not filed, did not have to file reports now as the recovery money gets spent over fiscal year 2010 and 2011, there will be many more recipients uh, filing and those areas need to be addressed as well to prevent future problems from emerging in this area. So I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to summarize our findings. I'd be happy to respond to questions at the appropriate point in time. Thank you very much, Mr. Dodaro. Uh, Chairman Devaney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Iser, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the activities of the Recovery Board and, in particular, the recipient reporting period 
that just ended October 30th. After I've made my opening remarks, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Much has transpired since the last time I testified before this committee in March, but I'll start with a discussion of recipient reporting. Overall, the Board's Mr. two Delaney, websites, Mr. the Delaney, inbound... Mr. Delaney, will you might just a little closer? Okay. Thank you. The inbound uh, reporting website, federalreporting.gov, and the public-facing portal, recovery.gov, worked together as intended during this first reporting period. On October 1st, recipients of recovery funds began reporting on their use of the funds, and between October 1st and October 30th, over 130,000 prime and subprime recipient award reports were filed. Since this was the first time that recipients were submitting data reports, and some states had in, been encountering technical challenges in filing bulk reports for the recipients, the Board decided to have a 10-day grace period where late filers were permitted to submit their required quarterly reports after the due date. However, they also re were required to explain their reasons for the delayed reporting. Beginning October 11th, OMB and the awarding agencies began the review of the recipient reports, providing comments and posing questions to recipients. Following this data quality review, prime recipients and sub-recipients worked to make corrections identified by the awarding agencies. As a result, about 21 percent of the recipient reports were modified. These changes are chronicled on a separate web page for all users to see and are downloadable for more experienced users. While there were very few technical difficulties with the reporting prior process, that is not to say that recipients did not encounter problems either in reporting or their ability to digest the guidance. As you undoubtedly know, OMB created a large amount of guidance on reporting. However, there were apparently still some reporting questions the recipients were unable to solve as GAO chronicled in their most recent report. Accordingly, we will continue to play an active role with OMB in crafting solutions to help resolve those reporting problems. Mr. Chairman, I believe these reporting problems can be divided into two categories, inactive da inaccurate data and noncompliance. First, the data reported was riddled with inaccuracies and contradictions. For example, a misplaced decimal made it look as though a company had awarded a $10 billion, was awarded a $10 billion contract when it had really been awarded a $10 million contract. Another obvious error, more than one entity put dollars awarded in the data field for jobs created or saved. Even more notorious were significant errors relating to congressional districts. These mistakes do not surprise me, however, and in a way they are not unequivocally bad. In reality, this data should serve in the long run as evidence of what transparency can achieve. In the past, this data would have been scrubbed from top to bottom before its release, and the agencies would never have released the information until it was near perfect. You and the American public are now seeing what agencies have seen internally for years. And what we are all seeing, at least following this first reporting period, is not particularly pretty. This raw form, unsanitized data may cause embarrassment for some agencies and recipients. But my expectation is that any embarrassment suffered will encourage self-correcting behavior and lead to better reporting in the future. In addition to incorrect data, the second major reporting problem was the considerable amount of non-reporting. The Board believes that the number of non-reporting recipients exceeds early OMB estimates. But we have not yet received their list. Given my decades of law enforcement experience, it should come as no surprise to anybody that I personally favor a penalty of some sort for non-compliers. The Recovery Act prescribes no penalties for failure to report, but perhaps an amendment to that effect would be something for Congress to consider. Even if criminal, cr cr criminal penalties are not practical, the fact that some would willfully not file is distressing and must be addressed. Agencies, at a minimum, will need to decide what actions they are willing to take to ensure that transparency and accountability aims of the Recovery Act are not disregarded. Perhaps an agency could refuse to provide any additional funds to a non-compliant recipient or demand that non-compliant recipients return funds not yet spent. For the Board's part, we intend to post those recipient names prominently on recovery.gov. Although the website presents the most visible aspect of the Board's work, the transparency it provides is only half of the Board's dual mission of transparency and accountability. Over the past several months, we have also made great strides in furthering our goal of accountability and oversight. Simply stated, the Board will now be utilizing recently procured software tools and analytical tools to provide an in-depth fraud analysis 
that interfaces with 8.5 million public records with the recipient data to help identify non-obvious relationships. We believe these non-obvious relationships would unveil facts that may have not been transparent to government officials at the time the contract or grant award was made. Today I can assure you that every recipient of a contract or grant or loan under the Recovery Act is being processed through this sophisticated, multifaceted system. To further assist our accountability mission, the Board has implemented a robust hotline solution where citizens can reach us by phone, electronically, fax, or regular mail. To date, we have received more than 350 citizen complaints. As you might expect, not all of these are concerned actual fraud, waste, or mismanagement, but those that did have been referred by our hotline staff to the appropriate IG for further inquiry. Meanwhile, the rest of the IG community has been working diligently to manage its recovery-related oversight responsibilities, with approximately 77 investigations having been opened and more than 390 audits, evaluations, and reviews are underway. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to conclude today with my oral remarks with a thought about transparency. I believe that the principal downside of transparency is embarrassment, and there is enough of that here to go all around. All of those involved, including the board I chair, will need to dedicate themselves to improve the quality of the data in the days and the weeks ahead. However, if I've learned anything yet about transparency, it's that it's harder to practice transparency than it is to talk about transparency. It's definitely not something for the faint of heart. Mr. Chairman, I will now be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Delaney. Uh, Deputy Secretary Miller. Uh, thank you, Chairman Towns, uh, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee. Uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act provides nearly $100 billion in funding to the Department of Education. This is to help avert layoffs of teachers, school personnel, and other public employees while advancing critical education reforms. We have distributed more than $67 billion of these funds, and recipients have reported saving or creating almost 400,000 jobs, including jobs for more than 300,000 teachers and others in public schools and in our colleges. The first Recovery Act funds released were supplements to existing formula grant programs, such as Title I and the Individual with Disabilities Education Act. These programs have well-developed monitoring systems and regulatory requirements that control expenditures, thus minimizing the risk of misuse. The next round of awards were made under the State Fiscal Stabilization Fund. This fund was used to support grants to help stabilize state and local government budgets in order to minimize reductions in education and other essential public services. This was done in exchange for a commitment to advance essential education reforms. We were able to obligate these funds quickly by taking advantage of the Department's existing grant administration systems and working closely with OMB to ensure compliance with the statutory requirements. A percentage of the stabilization fund was withheld for a Phase II application, which requires states to be transparent about their education reform efforts. Governors will need to provide data on four key areas of school reform as outlined by Congress in the Recovery Act. Those are achieving equity in teacher distribution, improving the collection and use of data, implementing high standards and high quality assessments, and turning around our most struggling schools. The Phase II requirements were published in the Federal Register on November 12th, and applications are due on January 11th. The remaining Recovery Act funding, which has yet to be released, is for discretionary grants, including the Race to the Top Fund and the Investing in Innovation Fund. The requirements for Race to the Top were posted on the Department's website on November 12th, and applications are due on January 19th. The Department is continuing to work hard to provide guidance and technical assistance to our grant recipients on the reporting requirements. We publish detailed official guidance and are holding biweekly webinars and conducting significant outreach with state and local leaders to ensure that recipients are well aware of the Recovery Act's unique reporting requirements. We are keeping the lines of communications open with grantees, and when clarification is needed, we are responding quickly and publicly. To ensure adequate financial systems and control of these funds, the Department utilizes its centralized grants, administration, and payment system, a system known as GAPS internally. At any time, we know exactly how much funding has been awarded to any grantee and how much funding has been drawn down. With GAPS, we not only screen any grantee requests for funds to be drawn down, but we also require grantees to certify that they will use the funds within three business days as required by the Cash Management Improvement Act. GAPS also has an excessive payments monitoring feature 
that requires Recovery Act payments over a set amount to be approved by the program office before those funds can be drawn down, as opposed to being drawn down automatically. We are expanding this process to apply all Department funds, not just Recovery Act funds. In our ongoing effort to prevent waste, fraud and abuse of Recovery Act funds, our Office of Inspector General is a significant asset. Our OIG has held more than 160 meetings with state and local officials on issues related to the Recovery Act. They have conducted audits in seven states in Puerto Rico to assess their internal control systems for administering the Recovery Act funds. To ensure that their findings inform program implementation, the OIG staff are in regular contact with staff offices across the Department to alert them to potential issues in the field. OIG intends to initiate additional audits in the coming months, increasing its focus on the use of funds and data quality. And the Recovery Act's recipient reporting provides a new tool in our efforts to ensure transparency. For the first time, grantees are required to provide quarterly reports, as you know, that account for their use of these funds. We are making considerable efforts to ensure recipients' compliance with the reporting requirements and help maximize the accuracy of their data. Due in large part to our extensive guidance and outreach effort, the Department achieved virtually 100 percent compliance with the reporting requirements among State agencies. A relatively small number of local level recipients encountered technical challenges in their reporting efforts, and the Department is working closely with them and any other recipients experiencing difficulties to ensure full compliance in the next round of reporting. The Department has forwarded to the Recovery Board any significant errors and material omissions that have been corrected, such as discrepancies in award size or funding agency. In instances where job data was flagged as being outside of the anticipated range, the Department has notified the recipient of the concern, provided a link to the relevant guidance, and maintained a record of how the guidance was being interpreted so that it could be clarified in the coming months. We will also develop a lesson learned document and begin another round of outreach in advance of the next period of reporting. In summary, as we work to refine the data reporting process, it is important to recognize the impressive level of transparency that has already been achieved. Every parent can go to recovery.gov and see how much the Recovery Act funding their school district have received. If any vendor receives more than $25,000 in payments, that information is available as well. This transparency provides an important tool for taxpayers to see how public funds are being used in their community and is a significant deterrent against fraud. In closing, I believe that the Department has been highly effective in implementing and overseeing its Recovery Act funds. We have received considerable feedback from our grantees on the guidance we provided. We will continue to work to improve data quality and further the unprecedented level of transparency. Moreover, we are confident that the Recovery Act has succeeded in keeping hundreds of thousands of teachers and other staff in schools, helping to ensure that despite the significant budget crisis that states face, our children can continue to get the education they need and deserve to prepare them for the future. Thank you again, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Miller. Uh, Deputy Secretary Picara. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, thank you for having me here today. Let me begin by sharing information about our progress in implementing this historic legislation. The Department of Transportation received $48.1 billion in resources to support infrastructure improvements and create and sustain jobs throughout the transportation sector. In the 38 weeks following enactment, we have obligated a total of $30.3 billion on more than 10,000 projects nationwide. More than 5.5 billion of these resources have been expended and more than 6,500 projects are underway or completed. In addition, work is underway to prepare for the award of the $8 billion the Recovery Act provided for high-speed passenger rail. On a parallel track, we are internally reviewing the applications for the $1.5 billion provided to the Department in discretionary grants. We expect to award these grants in January 2010, ahead of the February 17th deadline. Overall, the Department has made substantial progress in implementing the Recovery Act, and the Secretary and I are very proud of these accomplishments. Recovery Act funds are improving our transportation infrastructure while putting people back to work in cities and counties throughout the nation. As I travel around the country, I have talked with construction workers who have shared with me how difficult it was to provide for their families until they were employed or reemployed after being laid off on a Recovery Act project. This program has been an economic lifeline for people like Brandon Nestler, a construction site foreman from Wisconsin who was laid off last year after 18 years of service until a recovery funded project put him back to work full time overseeing grading work on I-94. Allison Barber, a new college graduate with a degree in construction management, 
had few job prospects until a construction company hired her as a full-time foreman on a major road project in Colorado. These workers, and many thousands like them, can look forward to a paycheck and ensure that their families have the resources they need. There's no question the Recovery Act is working as intended, putting America's to, Americans to work while making long-term investments in our infrastructure. Equally important is DOT's commitment to ensuring that all these funds are spent wisely, that the program meets all federal reporting requirements, and that we're able to share accurate information with the American people about our progress. The Recovery Act requires, among other things, that funding recipients provide independent reports of the numbers of direct jobs created and other project-related information. Section 1512 of the Recovery Act requires recipients to report this information as of September 30, 2009, and then again at the, each, at the end of each subsequent quarter through fiscal year 2010. Given that this reporting process was new for the recipient community, the Department of Transportation staff reached out to their state DOTs, affected transit and airport authorities, and Amtrak to assist them in, in understanding the reporting guidelines provided by the Office of Management and Budget. We also conducted a series of webinars and other training sessions to provide recipients with information needed to comply with the Section 1512 requirements. DOT staff continued to provide support to these recipients until the reporting database was closed on October 20th. As a result of these efforts, the recipient community for DOT reported 45,250 direct jobs created. Uh, DOT contractors reported more than 1,000 additional jobs. More than 96 percent of our recipient community successfully reported their data in the reporting system. Overall, we're pleased with the 1512 reporting and anticipate even more success in the future quarterly reporting. We're in the process of contacting the recipient community to identify any errors that could be corrected in the next reporting cycle. In addition, we're asking for their help in identifying recommended process improvements and lessons learned to simplify future reporting. As we begin planning for the next Section 1512 reporting cycle in January of 2010, we'll build upon our initial training and outreach efforts to help ensure success with the future recipient reporting requirements. This concludes my testimony, and I'll be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Let me thank all of you for your, your testimony. Um, we will start the questioning, and I'll, I'll start off. Um, I guess let me just direct this to you, Mr. Dodaro, and also to you, uh, Mr. Devaney. Uh, I mean, we all know in terms of um, how important this is, but is it really creating jobs? Jobs being created out of the stimulus package? Well, I think it's clear that the, the use of, of the money is intended for that purpose. The real question that we we're looking at in this case is what's the accuracy of the information that's that's being reported and the accuracy of the information needs to be improved and that that would I say would be the bottom line because there, but you do think jobs are being created well uh, the funds are being used for the appropriate purposes from what we've we've seen but the question is uh, you know how many jobs would be created or not there, there are several dimensions of this first of all of the amount the 787 billion dollars that is estimated to be spent. As of the reporting period here, only 22 percent of that amount of money had been spent as of September 30th. So it was $173 billion. Point number two is that that was spent both in the tax cuts, the entitlement programs, unemployment insurance, Medicaid, and others, and then in grants, contracts, and, and other things. The, the recipient reports only deal with the grants and contracts. So of the $173 billion that's been spent under the Recovery Act, only $47 billion is uh, subject to the reporting requirements under the Act. So even if you get an accurate count under the recipient reports, it's still a subset and it only focuses on job creation. Uh, and we think and make, we believe we made good recommendations to improve the accuracy so that there's a better basis for making informed judgments about how many jobs were created or saved. Mm -hmm. Mr. Devaney? Oh, I think I would agree totally with that. I think there's probably no doubt jobs are being created or saved. It's just the number and the accuracy of the number. We have a number. Uh, it's based on what the recipients told us uh, their interpretation of the guidance was. 
And uh, as the uh, acting controller suggests, um, that guidance needs to be clarified in a, in a big way, in a big hurry, to help recipients be a lot clearer uh, the next time they report. Uh, I have no doubt that there's a lot of jobs being created. I think it could be above or below 640. I think missing reports might drive the job numbers up. And I think there's enough inaccuracies in here to question the 640 number. It might go down. So it's somewhere in the middle there is a, is a balancing act. And, and as the quarters go on and as the accuracy gets better and recipients get better at reporting accurately, I think we'll get a much better picture. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the first time. And there were a lot of challenges for both recipients and, and agencies and, quite frankly, for my board. So um, my hope is that as we go forward, this is all going to get better. Right. You know, um, uh, the noncompliance, do you think that's the fact in terms of um, the lack of staff or being an unfunded mandate? Uh, what do you think um, 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 uh, that really sort of creates the noncompliance? Do you think that they're overworked? Uh, the, the request is just too much for them to handle at this time? Uh, I'm trying to get a handle on it because I yeah. like the idea when you indicated the fact that maybe some kind of penalty. And as you know, that uh, the ranking member in this, this committee has put forth legislation, you know, trying to create some relief. You know, uh, and of course, that's one reason, another reason why I have, you know, interest in this. And of course, maybe get your response even to our legislation. I think there's, there's, there's probably a number of reasons why reporters, uh, why recipients didn't report. Um, it could be as simple as they didn't want to. Uh, two, they were confused and didn't know they had to. Um, there are no penalties, and in that kind of a situation, just my enforcement background leads to, be, to believe that uh, penalties are a deterrent effect, and if there were some, I think we would have gotten better compliance. Um, but um, the fact is, I'm still trying to get a handle on how many didn't. Um, I think. Um, Mr. Dodaro suggested that it may be as high as 10 percent. Um, I'm in that range. Our, we're in that range ourselves. That's a little higher than what OMB's uh, early estimates are. But I'm waiting for that list. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, um, uh, Mr. Pocari, did you indicate in terms of your your situation has been very different? I understand you said 96 percent. Yes, Mr. Chairman. We, we uh, of our 1,037 recipients that we required to report, 96 percent uh, did. And, and I would point out that they are widely varying in capability. Some were very large state DOTs. Uh, we also had uh, municipalities like High Point, North Carolina, where you had one person who was uh, planning, designing, bidding the project, and doing all the reporting requirements. Uh, and we believe that is one of the reasons that. Uh, um, uh, th that 4 percent were not able to report. Right. I yield to the gentleman from California, the ranking member. I Five thank you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Devaney, uh, Secretary LaHood uh, said, we know for a fact that Recovery Act investment have created or saved more than 640,000 direct jobs so far. These are real, identifiable jobs directly funded by the Act. Can you support that? Uh, well, I think, I think, sir, it may be a fact that that's what is on my website, uh, but that may not be the, right. uh, the so, correct so number. To, to characterize, he may have been a little overzealous in saying real, identifiable, direct, and in fact, it's just a damn estimate, isn't it? It's what the recipients reported. Okay. Uh, I was reminded, by the way, that when a fish hit a, hits a wall, he says, damn. Uh, <laughs> that's what we're talking about here. Okay. So going through a couple of slides, uh, the uh, White House Press Secretary, Robert Gibbs, on October 30th, 2009, says the direct jobs in that, in that is, is, again, 640,329, referring to recovery.gov. Same day, uh, Vice President Biden's chief economic advisor, those jobs <coughs> accumulate to 650,000 jobs saved or created so far. Same day, Vice President Joe Biden, 
When the data is posted later today, it will show that we have created or saved 640,239 jobs directly from the contracting authority with the federal government. Last slide, CNN. Headline, stimulus creates 640,000 jobs. Pull up the propaganda again. Is there any reason when you don't know what the number really is that it's just an estimate that in fact there's about 60,000 jobs you pulled off and you didn't even pull off the 26,000 jobs the University of California says it claims, which would be half of its employees, were saved by this act and they don't have a net new hiring so you had to save existing employees, half of them. Isn't that just propaganda? Isn't it either misleading or, or designed to serve a political agenda when in fact it can't be substantiated, it is, not in, it is not true, and it is either misleading or designed to say we're doing a great job when in fact we don't know? Mr. Devaney, you're the most honest man I know. <laughs> uh, without, without a whole lot of in-between, Shouldn't we be more conservative and say, look, this is what the reports are. We're scrubbing it. This is a new system. It has its problems. We hope that at least they're reporting the dollars right, and we have no idea where, whether those people have the ability to calculate accurately the full-time time jobs equivalents, but we're going to get to the bottom of it. Wouldn't that be a fairer way to put it? I like that statement. Thank you, Mr. Devaney. <laughs> uh, now, I said to begin with that I commend you for what you're doing, and I'm going to concentrate really on the fact that we know this is, that the output is propaganda. We know we lost 3.8 million jobs. We know, for example, Secretary Miller, when he says he saved 300,000 jobs, these are simply transfers to pay for teachers. So it's not created. It's simply they, weren't, they, they are alleged not to be laid off. The money was moved to other parts of the budget, so those teachers kept the job and the state spent the same money they would have spent on teachers somewhere else. That's a reality of those 300,000 jobs. So now let's get down to the real question, which is, can you, with the money you have, Mr. Devaney, improve your site to have back engine capability so that when somebody puts an erroneous number in, when somebody puts in a number that doesn't jibe with what they were given, when somebody puts in a congressional district that doesn't exist, and I know you've scrubbed that now, but can you have the engine fact check it so that it comes back and says, hold it, you have these corrections. When I try to put the wrong credit card number in, I get a, I get a bounce back when I, when I try to buy online. Can you do that with the money you have today, or should Congress be giving you more dollars so that your prototype for online reporting in government can become robust enough to be everyone's prototype. I think we can do that, sir, and I, th I don't think we need any more money to do it. Um, to be quite honest with you, I think we needed this first quarter to totally understand which pieces of the data were going to cause the most problems. So now that we know, uh, we're doing that analysis. We, we certainly intend to build what we call internal logic checks into the system. So, for instance, if a uh, congressional district is selected that does, does not correspond with the zip code that's also put in there, uh, there's a bong that goes off somewhere and, uh, and the recipient is asked to, to spend some more time and come up with the right congressional district. One quick last follow-up. Will you also be producing the kind of software that would allow a single recipient trying to do their job and report properly to be able to do it at, at little or no cost? Will you create that so that the downstream, because I know the Department of Transportation, most of those people reported because they're used to reporting. It's, it's pretty similar to what they've been doing. Can you create the ability to enable more and more people to be able to report accurate by delivering additional uh, capability to them downstream? Is that part of your plan? Um, well, we certainly work uh, literally constantly with the states. And, and, and bear in mind, on this first reporting, uh, 31 states chose to do bulk reporting and uh, literally report for everybody in their state, all the recipients. And, uh, that actually um, enabled us to work with the, the people that were doing the reporting. And I think it worked well. I think there were problems encountered that, uh, that we resolved rather quickly. So, I, yes, it's a constant ongoing dialogue we're having with states and recipients. How can we make it better for you? And, and to the extent we can, we will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
First of all, I want to thank everybody for the testimony here today. This is a difficult job that you all have, uh, but I think it's, uh, the transparency issue is critical, and I, I suspect that the American people are grateful for it. The Recovery Act funds are going to amount apparently about 10 percent of our deficit over the next 10 years. Uh, I wish that we had given scrutiny to the other 90 percent, which of course comes from the, the uh, one to three trillion dollars spent on the Iraq war, which obviously wasn't very well accounted for. Uh, the you know, what will probably amount to over four to five trillion dollars for the 2001-2003 tax cuts, which weren't paid for, uh, and we can go on and on uh, with what brought us to this point. Uh, but I think it's very important that we have this transparency and accountability, and I thank all of you for doing that. But let me ask you, Mr. Devaney, the Recovery and Reinvestment Act contained certain Buy America requirements uh, that was intended to ensure that the stimulus money was spent uh, on U.S. companies. The law also allowed for agency heads to uh, waive those requirements if it met certain criteria. Uh, and I wanted to know whether or not you were aware that five agencies have granted more than two dozen exceptions to that Buy American rule. I'm aware that agencies are giving waivers. Okay. Uh, is it concerning to you at all that the information about those waivers um, is not really available on the recovery.gov? Uh, I think that's something we should probably get and put on recovery.gov. So if I'm clear, in your opinion at least, it would increase transparency on the use of the recovery funds to have uh, the information on those waivers and the rationale uh, and the amount that's expected to be spent on foreign-made goods noted publicly on recovery.com? I agree with that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, did you find that there was inadequate monitoring of subrecipients by the states? We're, we're continuing to look, to look at that issue. We do the bi-monthly reviews on the use of the money. There have been some concerns that we've reported in our earlier reports about the need to have better reporting or to ensure reporting on subrecipients. So we're continuing to look at that issue as part of our bi-monthly reports on the uses of the money by selected states and localities. Our next scheduled report there is due uh, this in early December, and so we'll be talking about that then. For this report, we focused on analyzing the database of the recipient reports, but we're very much attuned to that issue. It's very important, particularly where there are known uh, reporting uh, issues or known problems with some subrecipients. For example, HUD has identified high risk subrecipients in the public housing authorities. There's some concerns in the local education agencies. So we're looking to see what the federal agencies are doing, what state auditors are doing, and state program officials to monitor the use of the money at subrecipients. Great. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Miller, uh, will the department proactively review the uh, state subrecipient monitoring plans and will they audit uh, any of the states to determine whether or not those plans are uh, accurate or flawed? Uh, as part of our uh, guidance, we'll be working with OMB to develop the, the final guidance. We, we, even in this period, we had 25 staff working during the review process, reaching out to all 50, st all 50 states to understand, to help one convey the guidance and understand any issues. Um, so we'll continue to build on that effort to the degree that subrecipient issues have been identified. We'll continue to, to work with them to resolve the subrecipient reporting issues as well. Thank you. Mr. Bakari, how has uh, transportation been monitoring the subrecipients of the act? Uh, Congressman, we've been directly working with the recipients and in turn uh, asking them uh, to make sure their subrecipient data is correct. We're relying on the recipients uh, to uh, have correct data from their subrecipients. Uh, and Chairman Devaney, do you find that the uh, lack of resources for the states has impacted their ability to report on the subrecipients, uh, their inability to have the inspectors generals or other uh, auditing facilities? Uh, sir, I think it creates an enormous challenge for states. And uh, I'll give you the example. I went out to Colorado when they were reporting, and I walked by a football-sized field of uh, empty cubicles. They had literally laid off uh, a good part of their staff. They were facing a furlough the next week, and they had to report in three days. So, uh, And they had regular state work as well. So it, there are challenges out there. States are hurting. And, uh, and there's no doubt that they made a Herculean effort to try and, and report on time. And that's why I felt uh, a grace period for late reporters was, was, uh, was appropriate in this first reporting uh, cycle and, and maybe another, because I think they're doing their best. Uh, but uh, there's enormous money, monetary challenges out there. Thank you. Mr. Doro, yes. 
Yeah, uh, Congressman Tierney, uh, we have been uh, very concerned about the ability of the states and the auditors to oversee the funding. Uh, we have raised that issue in our earlier reports on the, on the bimonthly uh, reviews of the use of the money. A number of states are under fiscal stress. They have been cutting back in uh, some of these administrative areas. We have recommended that the Congress uh, allow a certain percentage of the money to be used for administrative oversight and uh, auditing uh, of those funds. We think it would be a prudent investment uh, given the size of this whole endeavor. Uh, and I know this committee had passed legislation and it's passed the House, but it's, uh, it's pending in the Senate right now. What a shock to all of us that the Senate hasn't acted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a shock. Uh, Congressman Burton, Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, President Obama brushed off criticism over his administration's inaccurate reporting on job creation Wednesday, telling Fox News the accounting is an inexact science and that any errors are a side issue when compared with the goal of turning the economy around. He said job growth is his number one responsibility. I think he said something like that back in January. And let's just look at what happened since January. You want to put that slide up? Jobs that they claim to have been saved or created, 640,329, and there are 15.7 million Americans unemployed. He said he would create 3.5 million jobs, and instead we have lost 3.8 million jobs. That is a difference of 7.3 million jobs, and yet this is a side issue. It is not a big deal. Uh, we have spent, we have authorized $787 billion, and you say you have spent $173 billion. I, I don't know what you have done with the rest of that money, but if it is available and it is supposed to stimulate job creation, why in the heck haven't you been doing it? makes no sense to me. I mean, we are suffering one of the biggest recessions in the history of this country, and you are telling me out of the, seven, out of the $787 billion you only spent $173 billion. I just don't understand. And now, and now the administration is talking about another stimulus. Now, if you take the $787 billion and you have only spent $173 billion, why do you need another stimulus? I, I, this just doesn't make any sense. And then you read that uh, let me get my glasses here because my eyes aren't as strong as they used to be. Now you have Peter Orzog at the White House saying that uh, the federal government made $98 billion in improper payments, including fraud, abuse, and everything else, and they can't uh, document where that money went. And this administration has been an absolute disaster as far as the economy is concerned. And now they're coming up with some more uh, minor things that they want to do, like change the health care system and add another one to three trillion dollars to the deficit. The deficit this year is 1.4 trillion, and we're still in the current fiscal year. That's over three times what it was last year when my Democrat colleagues were raising cane about it. It was 500 billion. They've, they've really they really outdone themselves. The White House has now got it up to 1.4 trillion this year, and we still have 10.2 percent unemployed. And it's probably going to go up. And you can't document the 640,329 jobs you're talking about. I, I, I feel like I'm listening to a baloney factory here because people come down from the White House and they give us these figures and they can't document the figures. And it just goes on and on and on. And then the president has the unmitigated gall to say job growth is his number one responsibility. Where has he been the last 11 months? He said that was the first thing he wanted to do was create jobs in this country. And he said he was going to create 3.5 million new jobs. Instead, we lost 3.8 million. And we got over 15 million people out of work. Unemployment's at 10.2 percent. I've said that before, but I'll say it again. This, this whole issue is just propaganda. It's political hyperbole. He's one of the most eloquent presidents I've ever seen in my life, I've ever heard in my life. But the fact of the matter is, all he does is campaign, and as far as getting results to help this economy, he's doing almost zero, pretty doggone close to it. And I think it's, 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 it's just disgusting to me that the American people are being told, you know, that these jobs are being saved or created, and that we're got jobs is number one. It's just, it, it's just not so. You can't even document these jobs. 640,000 jobs? 
How, how do you say a job's saved? Somebody just say, how do you prove that a job's been saved? How do you prove that a job's been created when unemployment's now 10.2%? So anybody? Well, I think in the case of education, since that represents a significant portion of the total jobs reported, I think we are confident. There have been many stories that well, well preceded the reporting period of layoff notices that were rescinded. Well, I have been out talking, again, outside of this reporting contest, Ms. Cho, a fourth grade teacher in Los Angeles. So many teachers who I have met with directly who said, thank God for the stimulus package because Mr. it, in Devaney, fact, allowed me, me, me to save jobs. Mr. Devaney, can you audit uh, uh, these jobs that have been created or saved? We are not in a position to audit them, no. So you can't audit it? The, the, the jobs that we are reporting came directly from the recipients of the recovery monies because that is what the Act said had to happen. But as far as auditing them, be able to document them, it is not really possible. Well, the, it, it's, it is the responsibility of the agencies to ensure that the accuracy of those, those recipient reports and, and that is what is happening. It is going to take time to, to get that well, accuracy. Told, I, I, I'm, I know I am finished, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, Mr. Issa asked you that question and you said, you know, there is no way to really prove all these jobs being saved or, or created. I can understand the gentleman's frustration. Eight years of failed economic policy. I can uh, understand uh, your uh, frustration. Uh, you can't uh, take I now that yield. Forever, Mr. I, I, <laughs> I yield to the. <laughs> Who's next? Huh? Who's next? Uh, comes from Van Hollen to Maryland. You have five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, people are entitled to their own opinions, but they are not entitled to their own facts. So I think it is important to put this in a little bit of context. Uh, when President Obama was sworn in uh, back in January, this economy was in total freefall. It was in collapse. We were in a rate of G GDP 6.5 negative growth. Uh, in that first quarter in January, we saw 700,000 Americans a month losing their job. This past quarter, GDP, GDP growth 3.5 percent plus. And while it is unacceptable that people are continuing to lose their jobs, it dropped from around 700,000 a month to under 200,000 a month. So let us keep this in context. The fact of the matter is that the economic recovery plan is working. Uh, now, Mr. Dodaro, let me just ask you a couple questions. Uh, with respect to the expenditures. Uh, as my colleagues have said, the recovery plan had $787 billion, uh, but as of today, $173 billion has actually been expended. Is that correct? Uh, as of September 30th. As uh, of that, September 30th. That, that is correct. Okay. And we picked that date because that was the reporting period for these right. first set of And reports. I know my colleagues, apparently from their testimony, would like to rush all $780 billion into the economic bloodstream immediately. But I think uh, you would agree, would you not, that that would likely cause a lot of waste in the process? Well, that definitely was a concern in the early stages. And I might uh, say, in terms of the CBO estimates of the stimulus bill before it was passed by the Congress, it was clear that the amount of money would be spent out over right. several years. That was planned, was it not? Yes, that is correct. You. And as you pointed out, of the 173 that has been spent so far, the part that is the subject of your review and the reporting uh, represented just $47 billion of that. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, are you a, do you have an economics background? No, but I have plenty of economics right. at GAO, right. economists. Uh, so let us put this in context. Right. There was also 6.3 in uh, what is called entitlement spending, for example, for unemployment compensation. Is that correct? That is correct. And would you agree that most economists say that by making sure people who are unemployed through no fault of their own have a little money to spend, that that also helps them go out and spend money in the economy and helps job creation? I think mo most economists would say that all three parts of the stimulus uh, uh, composition would create either direct or induced or indirect jobs. Correct. So when we are talking about 680,000 jobs with about $47 billion, we are actually undercounting the number of jobs that are created as a result of this expenditure. Isn't that correct? Well, there is no question that the recipient reports only entail a subset of the employment effects right. of the And based on what you said, it would mean that since about two-thirds are expended elsewhere, 
based on your experience and expertise, you would agree that there has been more jobs or sa saved or created as a result of those expenditures. Isn't that the case? Well, uh, what we have said in our report is that you need to look at the macroeconomic uh, estimates that have been made as a result of, of the expenditures in those areas, along with the recipient reports, to have a more complete picture. Right. Well, okay. Let me just read from your report because I think it is important to keep it in, in uh, perspective. You said that this reporting mechanism, which is unprecedented in its transparency and accountability, represents a, quote, solid first step in moving toward more transparency and accountability. Isn't that right? That is correct. Have you seen, ever seen any kind of transparency data collection effort on, of this magnitude in the United not, States? Not on a national scale like this. And, and that is why we said what we did because it is national in scope and it was in a relatively limited time frame given the uh, size of, of its uh, charge. Right. And in addition to the direct jobs, and these are only supposed to be counting direct jobs right. as an economist or someone who is familiar with uh, you know, what right. economists say, you would agree that there is also an indirect multiplier. Isn't that the tr correct? Uh, as we say in our report, they are indirect and induced. Uh, of course. And that would obviously right. add to the extent you have indirect jobs, that is on top of what is direct. Isn't that not the case? That is correct. Thank you. Mr. Picari, before you took your position as Deputy Secretary uh, at the Department of Transportation, you were the Secretary of Transportation in the State of Maryland, isn't that right? That's correct. Okay. So you have seen the direct impact of the stimulus monies in the State of Maryland, is that correct? Uh, that's absolutely true. I have a unique okay. perspective on this from the front lines, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, Congressman, that uh, before the Recovery Act, while it was being considered and immediately after it, uh, you could actually see the impact. Uh, we had contractors that were laying people off. We met with uh, members of the contracting community, associations, laid out the time frame for what we expected uh, in the bill um, and asked them at the, at the time not to lay off people because the right. work was coming. Would, would you characterize a job and the ability to pay the rent as propaganda? No, a, jo a job is a job. And in this uh, industry right now, those jobs are very precious. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it is uh, characterizing a, a, a real job and the ability to provide your family as propaganda is a disservice to the American people. Thank you. Thank you. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mike. Well, thank you. And thank you for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, as uh, Deputy Secretary of Transportation, uh, as, uh, in our committee, um, we uh, we hold these uh, follow-up uh, hearings and oversight on transportation spending just about monthly. And we are trying to track uh, the money. We are trying to get the money out. It appears to, to be some serious problems with the whole reporting system. Now, I was told that the reporting system, the software and all cost, uh, and I am not sure about this, is it 73 or $84 million? Do you know Mr. Devaney or Mr. Dondero? Uh, the eighty-four million dollar figure, sir, is, is eighty-four the, million is is the budget for the board for two and a half years. So, yeah, but the, that also, I mean, you're, you're, the board is one thing, but you have software that's been developed in a reporting system and people. Is that the whole cost, or? Uh, and no. then I've heard there's maybe ten million dollars that you've paid to sort of clean up the soft, uh, some of the software problems. The the uh, the board has uh, built two websites, one for reporting and one for displaying. And uh, the cost for those uh, so far is in the vicinity of 9 or $10 million. 9 to 10, so that, right. okay. Um, and you said that there are two couple, couple of problems, inaccurate data or noncompliance, those are the major problems. It is sort of like garbage in, garbage out. Uh, Mr. Dondero, you said that they were reporting uh, there were 4,000 reports with no money uh, spent and accounting for 50,000 jobs. Is, that was one of the first things you led with? That, that's correct, uh, right. Congressman. So yeah. it's Mr. Devaney, so if it's garbage in, it's, it's basically garbage reported out. Is that the way it's de devised? There's no qualitative uh, measure of what's coming in uh, done by you all, or well, is there? I, I would I would say, sir, that there are a lot of inaccuracies in this data, and the data was put in by recipients. But there are a lot of accuracies in the data as okay. well. Uh, there are well, probably the, the inaccuracies, though, is simple things like this isn't me or the Republican side. This is ABC News. They said in 
uh, it was reported in Arizona's 15th congressional district, uh, 30 jobs have been saved or created with just $761,000 expenditure in federal stimulus money. The problem is there's no 15th uh, district. Now we've got a multi-million dollar system to put the information in and this is the kind of data that we're getting in and we're not getting uh, correct information out. Is that, how could this happen? It happened because a recipient put in the wrong district. And so that's the first part is in, well, let's say you said inaccurate data and the two, the two problems with the system were uh, inaccurate data and what was the other one? Noncompliance. Right. Okay, the other one is that it was reported noncompliance. 10% um, of the recipients did not even report. Is that correct? Uh, we're trying to find that out, but it's well, no, probably wait. pretty close. I, I didn't make that up. I heard one of you all say 10% the recipients did not report. I think that uh, if I'm not wrong. That was in somebody's testimony. Yeah, I, 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 uh, Congressman did you get Mike, that? I, I, I said that that was OMB's estimate. And, okay. Uh, well, again. Uh, would, would the gentleman just leave, leave real quickly, for a comment? Don't take much of my time because I'll just get started. Again. When did it become important for someone to know what congressional district they were in for reporting? Uh, was there a reason that you had to have congressional districts? Was that for propaganda purposes? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, go into that right now. But let me take some other uh, sources here. Chicago Tribune. Garbage in, garbage out. More than 4.7, this is the story, more than 4.7 million in federal stimulus so far has been funneled into schools, Mr. Miller, in North Chicago and state federal officials said that the money has saved 473 teachers' jobs. Somebody had to report that. The problem is the district only employs 290 uh, teachers. Did you report that? Uh, no, these would have been reports made by subrecipients to the states, and we didn't have access to that information. Okay, you didn't have that, so that would have been a local district reporting. Reporting that? to the state, I think. Similarly, you had the largest Nobody school district in, Chicago, in, in Illinois, being Chicago, who reported zero jobs saved, Still and we would also question that. And so, part of our follow-up is to understand all but this. But did you count that as accurate. the 300,000 jobs saved by teachers? Any of this? Uh, 473 when the, uh, the entire district only employs 290? We counted roughly the, I believe it was the 18,000 jobs that's reported by the state of Illinois. Well, here's another one, this, this uh, radical rag, the Sacramento Bee. It says um, up to one-fourth of the uh, 110,000 jobs reported as saved by the federal stimulus money in California probably never were in danger, a Bee review has found. The California State University officials reported last week that they save more jobs with stimulus money than the number of jobs saved in Texas and 44 other states. Is this another garbage in, garbage out, Mr. Dondero, Mr. De Devaney? In, in that case, there were different interpretations made on the calculation of the FTEs, and that needs to be addressed. As, and we've and recommended you did say that, that we have time, to have some de definition. Gentleman's yes. time has long expired. I have just one more quick one, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I, I, Gen if I, I may. Gentlemen, we have votes coming up, and I'm, you know, I don't. I'm, I know you want to get one more in. It's yeah, just about like, the. I, like job to sent to China, but we don't want well, to hear that. We, we, we can answer that in writing. So I'll hold yeah. that one for later. Thank uh, you. Uh, Congresswoman Marcy Capture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All I have to say is I'm glad we have a Congress and uh, an administration that's focused on creating jobs. Uh, and uh, your data is helpful in um, assisting us in doing the best job we can possibly do for the American people. I wanted to ask you um, in the uh, transportation uh, area, um, with the $8 billion that was dedicated to the high-speed rail corridors, uh, it is my understanding that uh, it has been difficult for the Federal Railroad Administration to assume these new duties. And um, are there concerns within the Department about uh, your ability to move the dollars into the development of this important new infrastructure activity uh, that could, could truly help transform certainly the Great Lakes region and I'm sure other areas of the country. Uh, it, it's an excellent question. Uh, we are very focused on the $8 billion of high-speed rail money. We are currently reviewing the applications. We have multidisciplinary teams 
uh, that th uh, come from throughout the department, not just the Federal Railroad Administration. And we are straining a little bit uh, on this, but uh, we are confident uh, that uh, this uh, grant program and the high-speed rail program in general, uh, that we can accomplish those, um, and we will be um, uh, working to uh, uh, build that program uh, over time. Uh, could I ask you when you anticipate making your uh, first awards, Mr. Porcari? We, we currently anticipate making those awards in January of 2010. All right. Uh, let me also, and I don't know, uh, Mr. Devaney or Mr. Dodaro, if you can answer this question. I come, if you look around the country, uh, some areas, census tracts have unemployment of over 55 percent. Uh, some districts have unemployment, as does ours, of 11.1 to 18 percent. Does your data lend itself to be able to see whether the targeting is accurate of the funds? Because so much of this went through the states, and the states are in the state capital, and things happen with the money. Is there a way for us to interactively work with the data to assure that the areas that are hurting the most are getting some of the benefit? Is there any way to do that with the data sets being prepared? We do, we do in fact, uh, have a um, what we call a heat map on the website that shows unemployment. And it also shows where the recipients have reported contracts, grants and loans on that map. So we lay that on top of the unemployment uh, areas across the country by state, by county, and you can go in there and, and see if, uh, if areas of high unemployment have been getting their fair share of the uh, grants, contracts and loans. All right. Maybe your staff could uh, uh, contact uh, members who are on the committee or other interested members. I would certainly be interested in seeing how that really layers sure. uh, in northern Ohio, which is extraordinarily hard hit. And that leads me to my next question, um, Secretary Perkari. Um, I understand that GAO September 23rd bimonthly report indicated a significant number of bids under the Recovery Act uh, that were funded have come in under estimate and that the Secretary is considering um, redirecting some of those dollars for economically distressed communities. My whole district is an economically distressed community. To your knowledge, have states uh, redirected significant funding to these distressed communities yet in uh, response to Secretary LaHood's letter? Uh, yes. The short answer is yes. We have been working directly with states, uh, asking them to redirect funds wherever possible to economically distressed areas. Uh, these EDAs make up about 33 percent of the population. I would point out that 57 percent of our highway funds and 60 percent of uh, all of our projects overall are in those economically distressed areas. We have some states that have devoted 90 percent of their highway funds to economically distressed areas. Uh, that is in part because we have been asking them from the beginning to really focus on that. Uh, and where uh, the bids have come in lower than engineers estimate, which is uh, a number uh, of states, we have asked them to redirect the funding wherever possible to economically distressed areas. At what, uh, what is the next threshold for, you are saying 22 percent or so of the dollars, a quarter of the dollars have been committed to date. When do we expect 50 percent of the dollars to be committed from the recovery bill? In any of, you know, across the government, is there a threshold for February 1st or? Uh, it, well, well, first, um, the, uh, we work on a reimbursable basis. So um, th we have obligated $31 billion of our $48.1 uh, billion. But the way the transportation projects work, it is like buying a car. You don't pay Ford uh, when they are building it. You pay it when you buy it. And so we are reimbursing the states when the projects are completed uh, as a way to uh, be good stewards of uh, Federal tax dollars. The, so the obligation is the best measure for us, and we are at uh, 31 of 48 billion right now. I know the General time is limited, yeah, but Mr. General Chairman, could you allow Mr. Expired. Dodaro to answer that yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Congresswoman Captor, what we will do, we will go back and look at CBO's uh, estimated outlay schedule, but I think by the end of Federal fiscal year 2010, it would be about halfway. But we will go back and take a look, and I will submit something for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank each of our panelists for their efforts at assisting us in the issue of transparency uh, for this $787 billion stimulus package. I voted against this package, and I voted against it because I thought that there were no achievable standards in the, in the bill, there were no achievable goals, that it was ill-defined, that the spending was going to be misdirected, and that 
the deficits that were going to be generated would have a negative impact on our ability to create jobs. Lo and behold, the President is now saying that he's concerned that our deficits, created in part by this almost trillion dollar stimulus package, might impact our ability to create jobs in the future. I appreciate the transparency that you're providing because we're able to take a look at whether or not this was ill-defined with no achievable goals, no achievable standards. We're actually able to look at how the money is spent and make a decision as to whether or not this should have been done and hopefully be able to make a decision whether or not in the future we should do something like this, which I think would be, be very unfortunate if we continued to try to spend in this manner where there's no accountability on the, the spending, it's not directed and targeted toward job creation and just generates additional deficits. Mr. Miller, you had said um, about the jobs created uh, on the education side. And um, I have two things I, I want to comment on that. One, we, we were reminded by the other side of the aisle that we should deal with facts. So let's, let's talk about some of those facts. Um, according to the Wall Street Journal and uh, Jonathan Carl of ABC News, they looked at the job creation figures on the side of education. And they found, for example, that Head Start in Augusta, Georgia, claimed 317 jobs were created by a $790,000 grant. In reality, Mr. Carl reports that the money went toward a one-off pay hike for 317 employees, not creating 317 jobs. And that would be in your numbers you report to us today. No, actually, Head Start's out of the Health and Human Services, out of HHS. It's not a Department of Education program. It's certainly out of the aggregate number of jobs that are created. And it's an example of the claim of a job created. Well, there isn't a job created. There were, in fact, pay hikes that were provided, according to Mr. Carl. My concern is in the education sector and in the government sector is that as these monies are used in this manner, which obviously the bill and the act permits, that we're creating a cliff then for these government agencies as we're providing a, a one-time subsidy for increased costs for their operation. When they go to that next year where the stimulus is not there, the gap is going to be greater between their revenue and their operational costs, creating perhaps a, an, a more difficult problem and one where they're going to turn to the federal government for additional assistance. In, in my community, in Dayton, Ohio, stimulus uh, dollars were used for the paving of Main Street. And my concern is that although in the transportation sector we created jobs uh, or jobs were assisted in, in that project moving forward, by the time that the project began to well, it ended, there were probably less jobs along Main Street than were there before. This is not the type of spending that's going to create the type of sustainable jobs that we need in a, certainly a state like Ohio that is struggling so much uh, and needing job production. Now, in looking at this issue of the phantom uh, congressional districts, according to the um, recovery.org site in my congressional district, uh, $186,371,562 were spent creating 385.4 jobs in my congressional district. Translates out to roughly about slightly, slightly less than $500,000 being, being spent in, in trying to create a job. And then on the phantom districts, the, the number is the same. It claims that there were 11 jobs that were saved, over $5 million that were spent in phantom congressional districts, congressional districts that do not exist, translating to about $482,000 per job, not the type of investment that we want to, to continue. Now, what strikes me about the phantom congressional districts is that Ed Pound, the director of communications for the Obama administration's recoverment.org, said about this whole mess, who knows, man, who really knows? That's his quote in the Wall Street Journal today. Mr. Devaney, I want to know if you disagree with Mr. Pound. Well, I, cer I certainly wouldn't have said it that way. And I'll speak to him when I get back to the office. Um, the fact is that um, the, um, the, the, uh, the information may, in fact, be true about the jobs and the money spent. And the simple error has been the wrong congressional district. Um, and we think we can fix that next time out. But the accuracy of the data, uh, other than the congressional would that, district. Would that, is include, in, excuse me, would that include the jobs in Augusta, Georgia, for the 317 jobs created, where apparently everyone just got a raise instead of real jobs being created? I, I don't know why the uh, recipient reported it that way, and it may have been the state of Georgia that reported it. Because as you've said to us, and, and I appreciate your honesty, you're merely reporting what these people have told you. There really is no transparency. We don't really know how they spent this money. 
And apparently that accountability didn't occur in the beginning of the, the approval of the receiving this money either. Uh, I appreciate what you're doing, but it doesn't give us the type of information to ever believe that jobs have been created or saved. Having said that, sir, uh, and I don't disagree with you, having, but, but at, at this point in time, the fact that we have transparency allows us to see these anomalies and to understand if they occurred or didn't. The old non-transparent way, which is the way the government has acted in the past, you never would have seen it. I agree with you and I thank you for your efforts in that. Thank you and the gentleman's time has expired. Um, we have a vote on the floor and that uh, we will return at 12.30. We have three votes and uh, we will start again at 12.30. So uh, recess until 12.30. No, I don't. Yeah, I, thought, I, I didn't realize it was. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate very much the opportunity, and I appreciate all the witnesses being here and, and uh, providing the testimony with regard to how difficult it actually is uh, to pinpoint the numbers uh, of jobs created and the jobs being retained uh, through the efforts of the stimulus package. Um, but certainly we have heard a lot of propaganda. Uh, we've heard propaganda, you know, suggesting that this isn't having any effect, that we are not impacting the economy. Um, it seems crystal clear to me uh, that not only is this having a, a significant effect, and we can argue as to whether or not it's, it's 600,000 jobs, 640,000 jobs, 700,000 jobs in terms of direct benefit. But I'd like to get to a minute um, talking about exactly what it is those jobs are in terms of direct spending, uh, but then also talk about the multiplier effect that we see. Uh, through this investment. So, so the jobs that you're referring to are, are only looking at a small portion, a relatively small portion uh, of the spending itself. Uh, you know, $63.7 billion went into entitlements. Uh, tax relief was another almost third of this. And so this is only looking at a portion of the contracts, grants, and loans, correct? Mr. Dodaro, is that correct? Th that's correct. And so when, when we look at just that portion, and we say, we believe that there are jobs upward of 600,000 that have been created. Um, take, uh, for instance, a, a construction job. And I just brought with me you know, the spending that we've seen in greater Cincinnati, which is now upward of almost $700 million. And, and they describe here uh, a project that will directly employ 75 people in a construction project. Now, I assume that 75 is reported. But the individuals that might be uh, supplying the, the hardware for that job, the, the individuals that might be supplying the lumber for that job, the individuals that, and the companies that are supplying the roofing materials for that job, um, the, the transportation workers that bring the materials to the site, um, the, the uniform manufacturers that make the uniforms that help these people on the job. None of those are being included in, in this direct number, correct? Uh, that's correct. That's correct. The, the indirect uh, costs is, or uh, indirect benefits, rather, as you're talking about all the materials and the supplies and all those things, as well as how much additional spending is then induced, is not covered. It's just focused on the direct jobs that are created. And, and I assume we can use the same line of reasoning if we're talking about a construction project, uh, a road that's being built, and, and the cement manufacturers or the asphalt manufacturers, the, the designers, the architects, the engineers, all of the professional employees whose work uh, goes into those jobs that are being created. So that's the, the multiplier effect here is that we are paying partial salaries through these, through these contracts to hundreds of thousands of individuals who are participating and supporting these direct jobs that are being created. They're definitely indirect benefits, yes. I, I assume, Mr. Miller, that the same goes for education. 
that when we talk about uh, retaining hundreds of thousands of jobs of teachers, that those teachers go out to the grocery store and buy groceries. I assume that those same teachers also buy clothing uh, for their children and for their families. Uh, I assume that those teachers also drive automobiles and, and buy gas for those automobiles. I assume they also use electricity and use energy. I assume that the salaries uh, that are going into those teachers and, and supporting the families of those teachers through that spending is going to create and support jobs across the economy. Is that correct? No, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, and I would also say that we have seen other uses of funds, for example, in rural communities where the districts have bought laptops for students, have put smart boards, electronic devices to help accelerate and improve learning and, and allow them to develop skills, that the jobs associated with the producers of those smart boards, the training that has been provided to teachers is also not reflected in the over 300,000 job numbers that we have reported. So then, well, while you are reporting that several hundred thousand jobs have been retained uh, in terms of teachers, is, is it fair to say that that, that same uh, direct creation of jobs, we would see the inverse were that investment not made, so that we wouldn't see uh, the 300,000 jobs or so that have been created uh, for teachers, but we also would not see the ripple effect in the economy uh, of that investment going into those teachers? Yes. I think uh, looking at notices that were literally picked up, that were announced and then later rescinded because of the receipt of stimulus monies, we are confident that hundreds of thousands of teachers and educator related jobs would have been not saved had it been not for this money. Moreover, the impact that would have had on education and students and their learning and, the, frankly, the compromise that would have been to the long term growth because we need to have a student population that is prepared to compete we think would also be at risk. So we actually see the impact. Uh, outside of the direct uh, contracts that, that you are reporting on, uh, do you also believe, Mr. Dodaro, that the Medicaid transfer payments, uh, for example, are, are critically important uh, to supporting the health care industry and long-term care, uh, I, I assume nursing homes, I assume uh, assisted living providers, uh, medical device manufacturers, uh, doctors, uh, nurses, uh, physician aides, all of these individuals who work in the health care field. Uh, do you believe that, that their jobs are being supported or retained due to the direct investment made by the Medicaid transfer payments? As we have reported in the past upon the use of the monies by selected states and localities, the Medicaid uh, additional federal matching share has had at least two, two effects. One, it has helped support the increased number of people on the Medicaid rolls as a result of unemployment and allowed the, the states to maintain uh, eligibility requirements for Medicaid. So it has helped achieve one of the other objectives of the Act, in addition to jobs created and retained, was to help those affected by the recession. It has also helped achieve another one of the goals of the Act, which is to stabilize state and local government budgets. And the increased Federal share meant that some of the state share could be reduced, particularly in those states with high unemployment because they got additional Medicaid funding uh, based upon the unemployment rates. So that allowed them to then use that state money for other purposes as well. Gentleman, time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. I yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Devaney, um, in your response to the ranking member's letter, you said there is no way to really audit or certify that the 640,000 jobs number is is, is accurate. Earlier you also said that the data, the, the information, the numbers you get comes directly from the recipients. But isn't it true it first goes to the State and then to OMB and then to you guys? I mean, there's, is, it, is it three, this information, the recipients are getting the dollars, send it to the State, send it to OMB and then you get the information? Actually, uh, Congressman, it, it goes from recipients sometimes to States. In 31 States, the states collected that information and sent it in. In other states, it, we got information directly from the recipients. But it comes to something called federalreporting.gov, which we built and owned and maintained the integrity so of. So in some cases, it comes directly to you, not through OMB? That is true. The, the, the recipients are, for the most part, reporting directly to federalreporting.gov. In 31 states, though, there is at least some intermediate step. So there is a couple bites at the apple before this information goes public. Is that right? In, in 31 states, and, and the states did this differently, all states did it differently, but in some of those 31 states, Who made, there was a quality review that, of the, that data the 12, before it was The 12 out. projects, 12 programs that were left off, 
uh, that were not reported because someone made a determination that there was so much ridiculous information there that they shouldn't be public. Right. Who made that decision, you guys or someone else? Uh, OMB asked us to look at it, and we concurred. So in that case, it went to OMB before it went to you? No, it, no, sir. It was in the database, and OMB had access to the database along with the So agencies. who makes the call? This, the, the, so now we're back to the OMB doing it. Who's, who's actually making the call on when this stuff goes public? Well, at the and end how, of the, it, how it's displayed, how it's reported. At the end of the day, the board makes the call as to whether or not there was significant error in those in that data, and it would have caused public confusion. Okay, did the board make the call on these 12, or did OMB make the call? We both made the call. Well, which is it? And you said the board makes the call. Now you're saying both the made OMB the call. The OMB asked us to look at it. We concurred with their assessment that there was a lot going on with those 12, including 60,000 jobs that absolutely did not look right. Okay, the is there any, uh, change a little direction, is there any penalty for people who provide you with false, misleading, or ridiculous information? Any penalty, like, in other words, if, if we're getting ridiculous information, these folks should be, the money that was spent, if we can get some of it back, is there some kind of penalty for that? No, there isn't. No penalty? No. Do you find that strange? I mean, th think about this, think, put it in context, put it in the, the way the American people see it. We got a health care bill moving through the House, moving through the Congress, which says if you don't buy health care, you can go to jail. And now people are getting taxpayer dollars, giving ridiculous information, 12 projects that, that are so ridiculous you don't even list it, and there's no penalty for that? How are we going to correct that matter? Well, I, as I said earlier in my testimony this morning, I'm, I'm a big advocate for having penalties, but the Congress didn't put any penalties in. You'd be in favor of strong penalties for I would people be. who, who I would take be. taxpayer dollars and report crazy information. No, I'd be I'd be in, I'd be interested in certainly penalties for people who didn't report, and I would be equally interested in in looking at the issue of what happens when people knowingly false report. Okay, I think that could be a, pe a criminal penalty. Mr. Dodaro, you you you've had several years. How many years have you had experience with uh, the the General Accounting Office? Uh, 36 years. 36 years. In 36 years of serving uh, in that, uh, that part of our government, um, do you ever recall a time where we had this term created or saved? In other words, is this the first time this past year where we've used this kind of uh, sort of measurement, if you can even use that term with it, uh, is this the first time in the 36 years you've been looking at what the government does and accounting for how it spends taxpayer dollars? Is it the first time we've ever had that term? Well, it, it definitely, the whole issue of tracking the cr creation of jobs has always been a difficult methodological My challenge. question was real but straightforward. I, I understand what Created your question Created or is. saved. Is this I, the first time in 36 years, your experience in government that you know of, right. that we've ever had that term used as some, at least what some would call some kind of measurement? Now, uh, based upon my immediate recollection, I can't, I can't recall. Do you think that's a little strange, I, I just, that we have this new term? Well, it definitely is something that uh, given the context of what the uh, act was trying to achieve with the small double objectives, I don't think is, t is unreasonable. It's anyone, difficult, uh, anyone it's else difficult our, to measure. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel uh, recall any time prior, prior to this year we've ever had this, this quote measurement created or saved? I'll take that as a, as, as a no. Uh, last question I would have for our, our panel, I'll start with uh, the, sec uh, the Deputy Secretary from Transportation. What kind of contact do you have in a, on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis with, uh, with the administration, in particular Mr. Biden, who's a, whose responsibility it was to make sure we got this, this information in an accurate way? Do, do, you have a, do you have weekly meetings, or what kind of contact do you normally have? We, we uh, have uh, a number of contacts and, and uh, virtually daily interactions, twice weekly calls. Uh, regular uh, uh, meetings, uh, and uh, the the common theme uh, is making sure that we're getting these projects out there, making sure that do, we're do you have what kind of contact? My question was, what kind of contact do you have with with the vice president, with with the the office of the White House or the vice president? The vice president uh, leads periodic meetings uh, that include all the departments on this topic. If I could, Mr. Chairman, one last question for Mr. Devaney: Do you have any contact at all with the administration on a on a regular basis, or with the uh, or with the White House, or is it strictly with OMB? Uh, I do. I do see the vice president from time to time, uh, probably average uh, once a month. Did the vice president weigh in at all, if I could, Mr. Chairman, on the, the keeping the 12 off the list? Did he weigh in on that decision? No. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back. Thank you. Thank you, gentleman from Ohio. I now yield to the gentleman from gentleman from Vermont.
Yeah, Mr. Welch. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank uh, you gentlemen for being here. You have, you have an incredibly important job. It's about uh, accounting for the enormous amount of taxpayer money that has been invested in the stimulus program. And uh, you're doing a good job. And the reason you're doing a good job is all we want are the facts. Uh, we're not, it's Congress that authorized this program. Uh, the only thing you're being asked to do is report on how it's working. Uh, you're being asked to report on whether the money has gone missing. Uh, and you're doing it. And I know that uh, on our side of the aisle, and I expect on the other side of the aisle, the goal here is for us to get information as opposed to make political speeches. Uh, but we <laughs> we've heard quite a few political speeches. And frankly, uh, it, that's distressing to me. And I'll tell you why. Uh, we've got to rebuild America. And we know how we got to where we are at. We had a private sector financial system led by our big banks on Wall Street that completely disregarded the public trust that they have and nearly destroyed our economy. And it was so bad that one of the most conservative presidents uh, in my lifetime uh, came to Congress with the former, with his Secretary of Treasury, uh, the former chair of one of our major investment banking houses, and said that if Congress did not approve a $750 billion bailout over the weekend, then the economy as we knew it would be destroyed. Uh, I'm just reciting that because it gives us some perspective of why we find ourselves uh, in the situation that we're in. The private sector financial system put a gun to the head of the American economy, and they pulled the trigger. Uh, step one was to stabilize the financial system. I was one of the members of Congress who had no desire whatsoever to vote for that legislation to take $750 billion of taxpayer dollars and stabilize the financial system that had inflicted uh, a self-inflicted wound. But it did its damage. And when the economy went off the cliff about a year ago, we started seeing the unemployment rate skyrocket. And we saw hardworking Americans lose their jobs through no fault of their own. And that unemployment rate is continued to rise as we speak. And President Obama uh, came forward with a proposal on a stimulus package. Uh, and that, by the way, was endorsed, as you know, by Republican and Democratic economists. There was no dispute uh, except on the extreme edges as to whether or not in this dire situation the federal government had to be the spender of last resort. Again, not anything any of us wanted to do, uh, but something that was a broad consensus position had to be done. It had to be done so we could fight another day, not, so that we, not because we wanted to do it. And in the doing of it, the stimulus, there was a commitment that was made by Congress, and I think shared Republicans and Democrats whether they voted for it or not, that the money should go to jobs, that it should be accounted for. It shouldn't be distributed on the basis of political party or affiliation. It should be broadly beneficial to America. Now, <clears throat> taking a look at how it works, that's a fair and square, uh, fair and square question. Uh, and there was a lot of debate in Congress about how much of the stimulus should be allocated to tax cuts, how much for infrastructure. In the House, and I was among those who believed the more for infrastructure, the better, because it would create more jobs than the tax cuts. There was a big debate about whether we should use stimulus money to go back to the states to help maintain our teachers, our firefighters, and our police, and maintain and preserve those jobs. And I haven't heard any acknowledgment in the speeches here that this has been a lifeline. The stimulus has been a lifeline for our states, and I can speak for Vermont. Uh, we would have had a catastrophe in Vermont uh, that if we had not had the stimulus funds. Even with the stimulus funds, Vermont, with a Democratic legislature and a Republican governor, had to work together very hard to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to pass a budget. <clears throat> and we, we are continuing to experience a lot of pain. So uh, it's not my custom generally to make speeches, but apparently uh, today's <laughs> hearing is much about that. And the point I want to make is two. Number one, uh, I believe that the challenge for this Congress uh, is to do things that are going to help build up America, find ways where we can work together. And the stimulus is a necessary step that we took in order to maintain credibility. We've got to make sure that it's transparent and that we can account for what 
has been spent and how effectively it's been spent. Those are just factual questions, just the facts, ma'am. Mr. Devaney, if you have uh, suggestions about penalties, you know, let's give them to us and we can vote on them. But I hope it's specific. I encourage you to continue doing the great work that you're doing, and I encourage our members, uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> to focus on getting America back on its feet. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the <clears throat> gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your work and, and, and your being here. Uh, uh, Mr. Devaney, uh, when, following up on Mr. Jordan's question, when is the last time you personally spoke with the Vice President, Vice President Biden? I believe it was, um, may have been last week. Um, is there a master list of who is supposed to get the stimulus money? Do you have like a master list? Here's who's supposed to get the money. I don't have that. That's just mind-boggling to me that we don't have a list of even who is supposed to get the money. I think I, it's, I, Congressman, I think it's fair to say that each of the 28 agencies that oversee the recovery money have such a list. Um, and, and they're in the process right now of trying to determine whether or not each and every one of the, pe the recipients on that list actually reported. And I hope to get that result soon. It, it seems like a, a simple, uh, basic accounting uh, process to understand it, what it highlights is we don't know what we don't know, and that to me is a very scary proposition. In in moving forward, in my own state of Utah, uh, Representative uh, Bishop, one of my colleagues, uh, has has pointed out there was some 1.2 million dollars that went to the fourth congressional district of Utah. We only have three congressional districts. There was uh, 529 thousand eight hundred thirty-four dollars that went to the zero zero district. Congressional District of, of Utah. I simply do not understand how those very basic things can happen and puts to me the entire reporting uh, into question. Now suddenly you go to the website and it says, well, they're not accounted for, they're, you know, it's unattributed. Uh, how are we going to resolve this? Well, we don't uh, know, we don't even know who's supposed to get the money. Then when we say where it went to, it's going to congressional districts that don't even exist. Well, Congressman, I think first and foremost, the recipients in Utah put the wrong, zip, put the wrong congressional district in. They're the ones that entered that data. Now, uh, going forward, I think we can put technology in the system that says something like, if you're in a state with only one district, you can't put anything other than that district in there. If, you're in a, if, you're, if you enter a nine-digit zip code, it has to correspond and match the uh, congressional district. So uh, I think going forward, we can eliminate that. I, it, it, our time is so short. If we could follow up with the additional procedures, I would sincerely appreciate it. Um, my understanding from your testimony is that there have been some 340 complaints. There are 77 uh, investigations open and more than 390 audits. Can you help explain that, those numbers to me, please? Uh, of course. The, um, the how, and how many people do you have dedicated to perform those functions? Uh, the, the actual board has, has a limited number, maybe perhaps a dozen people that work in that area. But we, we leverage the resources of the 29 inspector generals okay. that, that oversee the money. So some of those complaints are coming in on our, on our hotline since the data has been released some 350 plus, and some of them came in before the data was released and directly to inspector generals. So out of all the complaints we've had come in, 77 investigations have been opened and 390 okay. or so. And audits again, we'll, we'll follow up with some additional details, but that does help, help clarify it. Mr. Miller, I, I'm, having read through your testimony and, and heard what you had to say, at the top of at least the printed out portion here of, of page five, it says, we had accounted for 97 percent of our Recovery Act obligations to date. What does that mean for the other three percent that you just, there's no, what does that mean? No, it means the, the bulk of our money is formula money and our large state fiscal stabilization that flows through states. In particular, there's two programs, Impact Aid and Federal Work Study, which goes directly, again, Work Study being, goes to individual students on part-time programs through colleges and universities. Given the very distributed nature of that, some of those recipients, colleges and universities, had difficulty understanding. But that represents such a small percentage. That, but 
specifically to answer Percentage your question, might, it would you, be the federal think work study. You might think it's aid. small, but it represents $2 billion. What I just want to make sure we understand is how we're going to account for what is unaccounted now, $2 billion worth of, uh, of dollars. And, and I'd just like to follow up with you. I see my time is, is, is ending here. Let me ask uh, one more question of you, Mr. Miller. It says in your testimony, a total of 742 reports out of 2,229 were changed during this recent agency review period. There's concerns on many fronts that literally about a third of these reports had to be changed. Either the information that they're getting and the system and the process they have to go to is terribly flawed or there is fraud going on. I, I mean, it's just such a staggeringly high number to have uh, to go back and change literally a third of the reports that are coming in. I, just I think with the unprecedented transparency, which we find as a change would be we did have the incorrect Treasury code. We had the incorrect DUNS number. These were technical changes in terms of to be consistent with transparencies. These were not, in fact, changes to the jobs being reported. The gentleman's time has expired. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a very crucial hearing. The timing of it is uh, great. And uh, I'm so glad to see Secretary Miller from my district, LA Unified, as our Deputy Secretary of Education. So, uh, and he knows the condition of our state and our tremendous uh, shortfall. So given the economic crisis uh, in the state of California, I was especially glad to see that my school district, the Los Angeles Unified School District, was the third largest recipient of Recovery Act funds in the state. And can you explain the impact these funds are having on the quality of education we're able to provide for our youth? And I do know that we have a serious shortfall in our budget in LA Unified. Yeah, I, and I think LA Unified, being the second largest school district in the country, um, is a great story in terms of the impact. I know uh, from the press that there were thousands of jobs uh, that were at risk that the superintendent was desperately trying to address given the state's budget shortfall and that the receipt of the stimulus money um, allowed, in this case, particularly thousands of pink slips to be picked up um, and so that the school year for the 09-10 school year, in fact, could be preserved and, and have more integrity. And I think in a, in a large urban school district, which has substantial student achievement issues in terms of the gap between those of high poverty and low poverty, that the, the need to maintain class sizes and not have them skyrocket, the need to ensure that you have the latest equipment is, is paramount if we ever are going to close the achievement gap. And I think uh, the stimulus money is very much have, have helped us make progress and prevent us from, from falling back. Uh, we could use another trance, couldn't we? <laughs> because even with the monies that have been received, there is not enough there to close the gap. And I've heard the superintendent just the beginning of this week talking about the layoffs, uh, shortened school weeks, uh, time off at no pay, and so on. Because I believe we're almost up to a million students. Uh, I understand before I got to the committee meeting that uh, there were some challenges to the data and talking about propaganda. But I wish we would remind ourselves the mistaken war we fought in Iraq, costing us $15 billion a month. And now they're asking for more troops in Afghanistan, which will cost us $5 billion a month. And if we could get just a portion of that to improve our education system, to improve our transportation system, we could do wonders in strengthening the education of our youth. I just attended a uh, high-tech uh, meeting early this morning, and I mentioned to them around the table that we're going to do the best we can in educating our children in sciences and math so we can be competitive. And uh, I take India. You know, with their large $1.1 billion, they test their kids and they send the most talented ones to a certain school. So I am hoping that we can stimulate, particularly in the educational field, and I want to get uh, Mr. Dodaro 
to comment on this, but I hope that we can send monies out to our educational institutions, our school boards, directly so that we can support their curriculum and particularly in higher education. You know, we're turning away students from our community colleges. And so those who are saying that the figures are propaganda, I can say come to my district, our unemployment has always been over two digits. And if we have a national unemployment of 10.2 percent, ours would be close to 11. Mr. Dodaro, in your overseeing, are you satisfied with the information you're getting about how we have used that stimulus money? And are we seeing jobs created? Can we look to the future with the stimulus, and if we have a second one, if we can indeed create jobs so that we can enhance school boards uh, throughout this nation, not just in mine, but throughout the nation, can you respond? Yes, on, on your uh, first point, I thought that the, the national data collection system that was set up was a good first step, but there are a number of data quality and reporting issues that are significant and need to be addressed to improve the quality of the information and the accuracy and completeness of it. So that's a challenge. We've made some recommendations. OMB has agreed to implement those recommendations. The extent to which they're implemented will increase the quality of the information. Now, with regard to future stimulus, one of the other mandates we have under the current bill, the Recovery Act, is to look at the impact of economic downturns on state governments and what, what effects it has on them on health care and other important areas like education. So I think you know, we will be examining that. Uh, it asks us to go back to the 1974-75 recession and look historically, including the latest economic downturn. One of the areas I think is very important is the future targeting of assistance, whether it's based on unemployment levels or other factors. There was some targeting in this uh, stimulus bill in the Medicaid area, but in other areas, I think that's something that could be looked to to perhaps be improved in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, the gentlewoman's time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Gao. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and um, I'm not interested in whether or not the stimulus bill is right or wrong. What I'm interested in is just plain number crunching. Um, now, Mr. Miller, based on your testimony, you said that $67 billion have been spent uh, through the Department of Education. And from the $67 billion, uh, approximately 400,000 jobs have been created or saved. Um, my question to you is, of the 300,000 educators, what is their average salary? Uh, as, as we look at the calculation, it would be roughly represent uh, a dollars per job saved, of roughly about, I believe, 105,000, which when we actually look at No, my question to you is, what the, is the average salary of, a, of an educator? Now, on a fully loaded basis, it's about $70,000, so which would be 70 percent of a dollar. Per, on, on the average per education. On a fully loaded basis. And so that's why when we actually, when we actually look at the total job saved in the context of awards to date, we triangulate and say for $100,000, if typically 70 percent is personnel cost, I'm sorry, the number seems to. Of the $100,000, 100,000 jobs that are remaining, what kind of jobs are they? Excuse me? Of the, you say that there are 300,000 the, jobs. These would be with the, uh, they'll call, we call government services. Many of them are government services because and 18 percent of the- And what's the average salary for those positions? Uh, I don't believe I have that information, but I can get that information to you. Would it be safe to say $50,000 per job? Again, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate, I'd hate to speculate. Now, based on my own uh, number crunching, uh, if you take $67 billion and divide it by 400,000 jobs, you, the number comes out to be about $167,000 per job. Now, if, if, a, if, a, if an average educator makes about $70,000, my question to you here mm -hmm. is, where did the other $100,000 go? I'm sorry, where, where did the other 100,000 jobs? Uh, no, where did the other $100,000 go? 
if, if, if an average educator makes $70,000 per year, based on your numbers, my calculation comes out to be about $167,000 per job. So but my that question be, that to you is, if we... For every dollar, for every dollar invested, 70% of it goes to personnel. So what you would take is, you would, you would only expect seven cents on, right, seven, 70 cents on the dollar to be for personnel costs. You'd have the whole... So, so if 70% if goes to personnel costs, the other 30% goes to... Capital, computers, all the things that you would need to support. So there's a notion of you need office, you need all on a fully loaded basis beyond just benefits. You have personal salary. So, so basically, basically mm -hmm. based on your own testimony, the numbers don't come out correctly. No, the, if, the opposite. If I you think have we've triangulated, we were confident that they actually, coming top down, that it actually matched. Sir, if you have 77 cents out of every dollar goes into personnel, in, in other words, go into the actual job safe or create, is that correct? Mm -hmm which according to, uh, so based on, based on your calculation, then 70% of $167,000 would be approximately $140,000. No, we're talking about the education related jobs. So part of this is understanding which math we're talking about. If you take the 325,000 educator related jobs, if you actually looked at the average education job per salary, and you would say it's roughly just over $100,000. If you said 70% of that, typically, if you look at the allocation of education budgets, 70% of educators, of, of, of the educational spend is personnel on a fully loaded basis. You would say roughly the math top Ms. down. Ms. Ms. Mr. Miller, mm -hmm. I've taught middle school. I've taught at the college level also. When I taught middle school, you know what, what my salary was? 20000 per year. When I taught at the college level, do you, do you know what my salary was? $28,000 per year. Now, my question, now, I, I, I am a little bit confused with respect to how you arrive at this $100,000 per educational job, because I know for a fact that teachers don't make $100,000 a year. All of the teachers in my district, if they're lucky, if they have a 20 or a 30 year experience, they'll be lucky to make 60 or $70,000 per year. So my question to you here is, based on your numbers, it would cost $167,000 per job if an average educator makes $67,000 per year. Where did that, where did that $100,000 remaining go? Where did that $100,000 go? Again, if I could try to clarify, I believe, and I can follow up the details, the average salary based on the National Center of Educational Sciences is roughly $50,000. If you actually look at So where the did benefits, the other $127,000 go? Once you load for benefits, it's roughly 24%. When you then, that, that's how you get to the just under 70% of personnel related cost for an education. And that's again, based my on national statistics. My question to you here is, if my, if my constituent were, were to ask me, how did you spend this money? I have to tell them that, well, of $167,000 that went into an educational job, 50,000 went to an educator, and I don't really know where the, 100, where the other $120,000 go. Again, you have to, if you, if you could appreciate, I'm, I've spent the bulk of my professional career both in private equity and as an operating executive, and like you, very familiar with finance. I think one of the first things we did as we tried to scrub the numbers was to ensure that the math you did tried to add scrub up. The, the gentleman's time has expired, <laughs> and let me Thank just you, say to him on the way to recognize him, Mr. Clay, you should have been teaching in New York or California. You would have made some money. <laughs> <laughs> the Mr. question, Clay. the word is that what he wanted to teach. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, uh, thank the panel for being here. Let me start the question with uh, uh, Deputy Secretary Pokari. Uh, transportation jobs allow for the awarding of contracts, uh, loans, grants, and the creation of, of projects all around the country. Uh, what is being done to ensure that of the 46,000 jobs reported to be created or saved by the Recovery Act, a fair proportion are going to women and minority employees. Uh, Congressman, it's, a, it's an excellent question. First, uh, none of the uh, normal requirements, including uh, disadvantaged business enterprise uh, goals, were waived as part of the Recovery Act. So we started uh, with the premise that in all the transportation projects, highway, transit, aviation, uh, that, that those requirements apply. Our recipients uh, are required to certify that they are uh, actually doing that 
we have been working in addition directly with the state DOTs uh, and um, uh, transit agencies, among others, uh, to make sure that that's uh, the case. Uh, it, it is, uh, uh, we focused on getting the projects underway quickly uh, and making sure that it's equitable at, uh, at the same time. You know, uh, many of the nation's transportation projects are less than or just more than 50% uh, complete. Uh, can you project future job numbers based on the reports you have received thus far? Uh, Congressman, I'm reluctant to, to project into the future on job numbers because, uh, first of all, it's not linear. It's uh, partly dependent on season uh, in many parts of the country. Uh, the weather weather dependency is is a, a big part of that. Um, we we also know that um, the uh, uh, the actual outlays that we have lag the work. The work gets done uh, under uh, local funding, and we reimburse at the end. Um, so uh, on the employment side, um, it, it's it's not uh, linear. But we know that we have uh, many additional created and saved jobs to come. We also have. Uh, uh, portions of our transportation dollars, uh, including the high-speed rail uh, program at $8 billion and the Tiger grants at $1.5 billion that have not yet been awarded. So uh, th those will come as well. Uh, we were trying to get projects out the door quickly. I think we were largely successful in that. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that there's a steady flow of projects around the country uh, throughout the entire uh, time period of the Recovery Act. And uh, we will be successful at that as well. Thank you for that response, Mr. Secretary. And I, I will not bring up the rescission issue. I know that's a separate, he separate hearing for us. Let me go to Secretary Miller next. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in your report, it shows that some of the greatest successes of the Recovery Act have occurred in school districts uh, by saving or creating 325,000 uh, education jobs for teachers and personnel. Uh, in my state of Missouri, an estimated 8,500 teachers have been saved from dismissal. Uh, can you discuss what the short and long-term impact on our children and their schools would have, would have been without uh, the Recovery Act education funds? Well, yeah, I, I think as we've traveled around the country and talked firsthand to superintendents, to principals and to teachers whose jobs literally were saved by the Recovery Act. Um, what they tell us uh, and what parents tell us if, is we could not afford to have those teachers not in the classroom at this critical time. And that without those jobs, I, our children's ability to continue to learn and to be more college and career ready at a time when it is so important that our high school graduates are prepared to go on to college and to go on to careers in an increasingly competitive world where more jobs are being competed in India and China. And as they make investments in their education system, that this is a critical time that we must sustain and enhance our investment in education. And so they're very thankful and they feel that if this money hadn't been there, those jobs would not have been there and their children would have suffered. Thank you for your response. And real quickly, uh, Mr. Devaney, uh, given your experiences in government, are you aware of any other efforts to collect data and publicly provide information on programs uh, that is similar in scope to recovery.gov? No, sir. Are you aware of any similar website or tracking mechanism uh, in the history of the federal government aimed at providing this level of transparency on government spending? No, sir. Okay, very good. And uh, Madam Chair, I am through with my question and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Clay. Uh, Mr. Bilbray. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I spent 18 years in local government filling out reports and uh, applications to the federal government. So this process is uh, very interesting to say the least. <clears throat> starting, I guess, in 1976 before Jimmy Carter was elected, so I sort of date myself. Uh, who decided what questions were going to be included in this survey? Uh, who decided what, que what questions Which questions were going to be in this reporting process? Uh, that would be OMB. OMB. Right. 
why in the world would a congressional seat be included in a report of this type? I actually believe, sir, if my memory serves me right, that is embedded in the Act, in the law itself, that the recipients were supposed to report that. So OMB put out the guidance that they had to. So the Act was actually engineered to specifically identify political subdivisions within the Federal Government rather than using the traditional what we have used for 30, 40 years, and that is using the zip code. Uh, zip codes are included as well, but the, it is in the Act that congressional districts will be uh, reported. So the Act we passed literally had this political element mandated into it? It did. I guess it sort of indicates author intent when you see that kind of thing. I, does, in your experience, do you remember any identifications like this before rather than just using the zip codes and extrapolating that item out? Off the top of my head, I don't. Yeah. I mean, this problem could have been avoided if the, if the Act itself hadn't included this political element and just stuck to the traditional zip code um, reporting. In this reporting, by using the, the uh, districts, what if you had a situation like the improvement of the rideshare lane on I-15 in San Diego County that goes through Mr. Hunter's, Mr. Isa's, and my district? Does that count as three jobs? Uh, no. Uh, I think that, that, that each of the, um, if, if it was a company, let's say it was a contractor that was building that, uh, that contractor as a vendor would report to the state that they were building a highway and they would count the jobs no matter what state or what district they were in. So uh, you are going to get a lot of <coughs> projects that span multiple districts and states. Okay. The um, <clears throat> transportation situation, uh, as we are throwing this money or sending this money out <clears throat> to build projects, has there been any discussion at all, seeing that we took an extraordinary effort and did an emergency uh, push to get that money out there, has there been any backup push on the regulatory issues that you will face? And a good example is I was on, on the board that built the light rail system for, for San Diego. Um, the environmental obstructionism of trying to use an existing rail technically is there, but you and I know logically it is absurd. You know, if you are going to improve rail on a site that has been used for 200 years, there is not the issues that environmentally out there. Has there been any discussion at all in your department at coming back and getting us to fast track the regulatory process to allow the projects like the high speed rail in California to be able to move forward? and spend the money on construction rather than litigation. Congressman, there has been a, a lot of discussion about various ways to streamline the process, whether it is uh, our internal working group on the new starts uh, uh, transit streamlining process uh, or in, in more general terms. What you will find with many of the transportation recovery projects uh, is uh, states uh, and uh, authorities, uh, aviation and transit, put an emphasis on uh, ready to go off the shelf projects that had been through those approval processes so that they could get underway quickly and the jobs would be either saved or created quickly. Uh, that is the bulk of what you see around uh, the nation in the projects that are underway. Uh, the transportation projects uh, that are imminent uh, tend to be the larger, more complex ones uh, that needed either some uh, uh, final approvals or were finishing design. Well, and I, we can go through the issue of what we see around, too, is all the advertising signs that were mandated and then the mandate was withdrawn and the flexibility of, um, of you know, costs be going from 3,000 in one state to 500 in the other. Um, but this whole process being engineered from the beginning with a political statement engineered into the accounting process, I mean, this kind of accounting where you exaggerate the benefits, you underestimate the, the problems. Um, is exactly how Enron got itself in trouble and ended up in jail. And as public agencies, we damn them for doing that. And this accounting process seems to be reflecting the an Enron time approach. Is, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Is up. Thank you, Mr. Bilbrey. Um, Secretary Miller, um, your uh, department announced uh, 350,000, uh, 325,000, I'm told, education jobs uh, a few weeks ago. 
How confident are you, given all we've heard uh, today in this hearing, in those jobs and that we will not find the same problems as to those jobs? Uh, we as a department are confident that, that 300,000 plus jobs, educator jobs, have been saved. Uh, on what basis, sir? Um, excuse me? On, on and the basis, uh, I think of a, a variety of things that give us that confidence. One, our actual guidance that we invested heavily in was really meant to get at the core issue of not just monies allocated, but specifically, if I, just to quote the guidance. Uh, a job retained is an existing position that would not have been continued to be filled were it not for Recovery Act funding. So the intent and the guidance that we invested in was, in fact, to get at this core issue, not some clever accounting for monies allocated, but the core issue of did this money. So our investment in the guidance would be one. Two, uh, while it may have been confusing, we actually looked at state budgets, the portion of state's budgets that, in fact, were addressed by the stimulus monies as reported by the states. We then did the calculations of the, the jobs that were reported by the states in aggregate, looked at what that would have translated to on a per, per, per job basis, understood what, how did that compare with historical trends, and that was another way that we could triangulate it on it. Third, we actually, independent of the reporting period, since, since the Recovery Act monies were first started being available last April, there have been well over 1,000 news stories independent news stories talking and citing specific jobs saved gave us confidence that the numbers that are being reported are accurate. As we scrubbed, and we have the, the process that, uh, in terms of data quality, we had automatic programs that actually looked at re recipient reporting, where there were outliers, flagged outliers, contacted all 50 states that says, in aggregate, we are confident in them. Because you know that's going to be, <laughs> and those words are going to be quoted back to you. So that's why I, I wanted to give you an opportunity if you think that, that there's any pullback uh, that should go on the record, you need to, to do it because that's a very specific number and a very vital. Uh, no, I, and, I, and I think I understand. I think the question becomes um, with 14,000 school districts, with 100,000 schools, as you then get to the precision of school A versus school B, Right? And, and we don't have access in that level of transparency. So at, do I, do I, if you'd say, do I expect at that level that, that will these numbers be fine-tuned mm -hmm. from school A to school B, from district A to district B? I actually think we will see adjustments made over the course of the next quarter. Yeah. But again, I think in aggregate, as this gets rebalanced and fine-tuned, do we think we will still be coming right back to job save numbers, order of magnitude in the 325,000? I think the answer is yes. Well, I, 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 actually, I appreciate what, what we're trying to do for the first time ever here. Um, we probably need to be operating in the plus or minuses or uh, in, in some kind of range, uh, given the many levels of government with which we are dealing. We would have even tried to do this kind of thing before. Uh, I think the problem may have much to do with the expectation that here's a number and nothing is more specific uh, and finite as a number. So if I got a number, I got the goods on you. As far as we're concerned, uh, or at least speaking for myself, uh, the most important thing is the transparency here, tracking these numbers, correcting these errors. Let me ask you a question in that regard. Given human fallibility, even if all of this data were at one level, um, there, there is, uh, there has been established by OMB a, a way to do quality reviews. So that here you've got something very specific between the 22nd day and the 29th day, it seems, uh, during, um, following the end of each quarter. Uh, there is supposed to be a review. And uh, this review is apparently intended to resolve just such material omissions and reporting errors uh, as have been under discussion at, at these hearing, at, th at this hearing today. Um, if these reviews were conducted and if a material omission or significant reporting error was discovered, 
Was there an immediate process for correcting it? Were people just so quick to just get on to the next step to report the data? Uh, if you had a quality review period, uh, why didn't that period work better? Uh, uh, that, can I, that I, I can ask uh, uh, Secretary Miller, Fakari, um, e either of you might be the, or, or Mr. Chairman stab, Devaney. If I could take a stab at that. I think, um, I think this was the very first time that so much data had been asked to be reported by recipients. It's also the very first time that agencies had to oversee that kind of an activity. They had to report by the well, wait, 10th. Well, was 10 days an adequate time? Well, you, you gave 10 a, days. Um, uh, is seven days for that matter enough time for federal agencies to review the information? Well, it, I, at the end of the day, I don't think it is. I, I think that. Are you considering what time period, given the experience you now have? I think given the experience we've had now, I think we are we are seriously considering trying to think of a way to extend the period of time in which corrections can be made. Well, at this point, I think uh, since since even the smallest error will be held against you, no matter how many jobs you provide, it, it probably would be better uh, to 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 engage in some delay. There are a whole lot of us here. Uh, in on on this panel, who are, who are more interested in jobs created, recognizing that the United States has never undertaken uh, quite the um, logarithm you have. How much were created? How much would have been created anyway? You can always come back saying they would have been created anyway, but you can't. Not in this recession, we believe. Uh, the economists may need to get to work on their models. By the way. Uh, about how many jobs do you create on your own <laughs> in a recession. Okay, uh, 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 locality, you're in the deepest recession uh, ever. Leave out the word depression. The deepest recession ever. There must be a model somewhere that tells me in the, in the midst of um, uh, localities laying off everybody they can find even after they get stimulus money. There must be a model that says uh, jobs get created uh, and the kinds of jobs that get created. And we see people, for example, in the District of Columbia dismissed uh, after school starts. School uh, has started and teachers dismissed. Then uh, we know for sure this is not a very exact science and whatever models we're using uh, have not had to confront uh, this situation before. But frankly, I've been very impressed by all the overlapping um, accountability. And given that overlapping accountability why that did not work, I'm looking at um, um, the recovery board. Then we have the IGs. And we have the state auditors. And we have the prime recipients. And then uh, all this gets publicized through recovery.gov between OMB and the recovery board. Now, the first thing that occurred to me is if all these actors are involved, surely they're not stumbling all over one another. Uh, forgive me if, if it, it, it seems to me that maybe this comes out of my background of dealing with appeals. If one dealt sequentially so that one finds errors in the prior, um, prior level, for example, I can understand that. But what I need to understand here is how these layers either get coordinated, uh, whether they have specific roles, the IG, the, the recovery board, the, 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 the the people responsible within the states, the recipients themselves, have they been given any guidance uh, that would sort them out so that they might be a check one on another? Or are they all trying to go at the data at one time with their own version of how it should be interpreted? Well, 
uh, with respect to the IGs, they they haven't they haven't gotten involved in the. All right, I, 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 I'll accept what you say about the IGs, yeah. but of course and, they are a possible and, layer. And the board has a small staff, and OMB has a small staff. We're trying to be as helpful as we can be. So Both. who does that really leave with the responsibility? It, 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 it leaves the recipients themselves are responsible for not only what they put in, but for also checking later to make sure they didn't make any mistakes. And it also leaves the agencies in a position where they have to make darn sure those recipients are, are reporting as accurately as possible. At the and federal it, level or at the state level? At, at both levels, quite frankly. I think the federal agencies can only see so much. So as they look down, they're going to have to depend on their state counterparts as well to, to talk to the recipients. And, and as it cascades down, hopefully at the end of the day, a recipient will get a notification that something's wrong and you need to look at that. But the way the OMB guidance is, only recipients can actually change the data. Federal agencies, the board, OMB can't change the data. So the recipients have to be notified that we think there's a mistake and then they have to change the data. And so that, that, of course, goes to how long it takes to make sure that it, all of that can it occurs. Does, yes. Uh, I recognize that the uh, administration, in fact, I myself, was very pleased to have some data to use when the first, was it 30,000 jobs came out? Uh, to indicate that this was this money was was certainly producing something, uh, and I and you've been under a lot of pressure uh, to to show that it's producing something. Now, of course, as is always the case with Congress, when they do oversight, you will continue to be under that pressure and under the same pressure to correct the errors. At least you have the understanding from me that you're doing what has never been done before. Let me ask you about analyzing what's occurred. Um, I think this is pretty organic, that this is one of those things, kind of like the common law, you learn by doing it, and you build on it, and you, you build a better mousetrap each time, or you perfect the mousetrap each time. Um, in addition to OMB, agencies had to provide guidance to recipients to explain the, the requirements. Now we've got the next quarterly reporting period, and that's going to be sometime in January. And each quarter thereafter, uh, the funds are going to continue to be spent. I guess that's the last year of, of the stimulus funding. Um, is there a way in which, as an administration, you are reviewing the first quarter of reporting and to analyze the problems, then to streamline or improve upon the process in some way that everybody, so that everybody will be doing the same thing. Could you tell us how, uh, what that process looks like, that review process based on hard data now before you, where you've sorted out what kinds of mistakes were made, I think some of them inevitably made so that you would then give, I take it, new or revised uh, instructions to whom? And how is that being communicated across the government? Well, uh, certainly everybody involved in this is engaged in a lessons learned exercise. We're all looking, at, and, I, and I would include, and I'm sure the agencies are as well, but OMB and the board are engaged in this lessons learned activity right now. And we, will, we, we have learned a lot from this first reporting period. We've learned a lot from the fine report that GAO put out today as well. And I know that OMB has responded that they're going to implement GAO's recommendations. I suspect the IGs will be involved in making some recommendations as well. And what we hope to do is make each and every reporting period run more smoothly than the last. And there are certainly some technical fixes that the board can do on this next reporting period to make it easier for reporters, re recipients to report. And additional guidance or clarification of guidance by OMB is going to be very helpful as well. And if I yes. uh, may add, Madam Chair, uh, in practical terms, even during this first reporting period, across agencies, we've been trying to make these corrections in real time. We have these twice weekly conference calls that include all the agencies where we're talking about recipient reporting 
what we've seen. So these are conference calls. These are among all the agencies. Among involved. all the agencies. It, we do this uh, twice a week. I have personally found it actually to be very helpful because. And uh, where do those emanate from? OMB or the th recovery board? Uh, the recovery office uh, is is actually uh, leading those, but we're finding common issues on recipient reporting. For example, uh, across agencies, we see where we should focus our assistance efforts, uh, the kind of common errors. So uh, I know that. Uh, that, that the recipient reporting will be better in the next quarter. But even getting through this first uh, uh, reporting cycle, some of the things that people have seen, we've been able to do that feedback loop very quickly. Uh, again, you will know best um, from your own feedback and from your own lessons learned how this should be done. My own, I must tell you, my own sense is that in reporting hard numbers, one should should be very careful. Um, I myself would would not use single numbers. I'm not here to tell you how to do it, but people who engage in um, uncertainty every day have learned how to develop ranges uh, so that people do not have raised expectations, and so that people do not play a game of gotcha. And let me tell you something about gotcha. We have never had before this uh, committee anything approaching quarterly reports. The way in which the Congress has operated, uh, certainly in the years I was in the minority, is wait until <laughs> um, something is all over. Then the easy thing to do is to call in people and recount the errors that occurred. What this hearing is doing is working with the administration to track what has never been tracked before so that we can get something out of a hearing that is corrective and helpful so that while we are disappointed that the numbers uh, were erroneous, uh, we, we believe that the importance of this hearing is the process you just described. That may be the most important thing that could possibly happen because the kind of error, errors that, that my agency found uh, may be entirely different from that of another agency. And then in the next quarter, I get that kind of error. But nobody forewarned me that that kind of error comes up. So did this sharing, yeah, of errors and of corrections across uh, the boundary lines of agencies, despite their different missions, uh, could not be more helpful. Uh, the, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is to recess this hearing for 15 minutes, let us say, until, what is that, 2 o'clock? Uh, Who's the next speaker? He's not here. We'll recess uh, for uh, un until two o'clock. My loss, your gain, the vote. <laughs> Now we move to our second panel of Honorable Dick Army, is the chairman of the advocacy group Freedom Works. Dr. Dr. Army is the former majority leader and served in the United States House of Representatives for 18 years. And Dr. Army holds a PhD in economics from the University of Oklahoma and is the former chairman of the University of North Texas Economic Department. Of course, welcome. Good to see you. Happy to know there's life after this place. And now we also introduce uh, Dr. Irons. Uh, he is the research and policy director at the Economic Policy Institute. His areas of expertise include the United States economy and economic policy, with an emphasis on federal tax and budget policy. Dr. Irons earned his PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and is the author of numerous publications. Dr. Irons formerly was economics professor at Amherst College and worked at the Center of American Progress, 
OMB Watch, and of course, Brookings Institute and Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Welcome, Dr. Irons. It's a long standing tradition here that we swear our witnesses in. So uh, if you both would stand and raise your right hand. Agree to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. If so, please answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And Dr. Army, we will start with you first, um, of course. And as you know, that the procedure is that we have five minutes, and then, of course, the uh, uh, we have the opportunity after that to raise questions with you and, uh, and further comments that you might have. So we welcome you and Dr. Army. Push that button. I'd like to spend, I'll be again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the invitation. And I'd like to spend a few minutes, just a quick review. The intellectual gantry for uh, such public policies as the stimulus package, of course, is John Maynard Keynes' general theory. And the notion was that in times of economic distress, downturn, governments could uh, put a spur to the economy by, uh, I think they called it pump priming. In Texas, we call it putting a spur to the economy. Uh, by either uh, temporarily running deficits uh, or uh, by either increasing spending or cutting taxes. There is a mixed review of the history of the Keynesian policy prescriptions and their success. I would be one that would suggest that uh, uh, on the uh, stimulate the economy through increasing spending side, there's a pretty pretty de minimis uh, record of success in the history of the application of these theories, while on the other side of the coin, stimulating the economy through reduction in taxes has been a fairly uh, rich history of some success, with the two most notable cases being the Kennedy tax cuts of 1962 uh, and the Reagan tax cuts of about 1982. Uh, I, of course, lived as an economist through both of these times, very exciting times for us in my, our profession. But one of the sweet ironies that I reflect back on in, in the academic community, when President Kennedy proposed stimulating the economy through cutting taxes so you could uh, also increase revenues, it was considered an act of genius. He was celebrated in the academic community of being a president who was teaching us economics. When Ronald Reagan came back with exactly the same idea 20 years later, he was considered a moron in the academic community, <laughs> despite the fact that his success has to be considered even greater than that temporary success of the Kennedy tax cuts. I would argue that the larger problem that beleaguers the American economy today is we have an economy that is institutionally, structurally out of balance. And by that, I think you should look back and say the strength of every economy is the private sector. Every nation state in the history of the world that has tried to do, grow a strong economy through the public sector has had abject failure, serious resource misallocations and poverty and, and hardship. Or the United States, on the other hand, building its uh, e economy on the basis of the private sector's initiatives has had the greatest track record in the history of the world. But there's a balance that must be struck between public and private activity. And there are various subscriptions. You can go back to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations. He had a very good outline. Uh, but the general principle was the public sector should be de minimis and focused on uh, such things as uh, uh, public capital, uh, assist, administering a system of justice, especially such things as a system of contracts, which is, of course, if you have private enterprise, contracts are important, and, and you must, of course, be confident that your government will protect your contractual rights, uh, and, uh, and, of course, security needs, uh, but a uh, minimum. The, the basic notion here is that the, the government must has a limited list of things that it must do, and it must do well with efficiency, the primary product of their successful efforts, of course, increased productivity on the private side, such roads, things as roads and transportation. I believe that is what has happened in the United States is we've crossed beyond the point of diminishing returns as government has grown out of control uh, we've gotten to the point of negative returns. This, this discussion is, being, is a discussion, is a lively discussion internationally. 
Uh, what is the appropriate size of the government relative to the economy? Uh, and there, the, I'm proud to tell you that this international discussion is being carried out by and large in terms of something called the Army Curve. And the Army Curve says there's a point that is optimal where you have the necessary and sufficient rational de devotion of resources to government enterprise in support of private se uh, sector initiatives and you maximize the performance of your economy. Beyond that, it becomes a burden. I think we've long since gone beyond that, ma that optimal point, and we are now at a point where the biggest single problem that belabors the American economy is the fact that the federal government is such a burden. And I, my analogy is this. In the competition between world economies, the United States has the fastest, most beautiful horse in the race. There's no doubt about it. The, our record of uh, accomplishment in the, uh, providing a standard of living for our citizenry is unparalleled, unchallenged even. But the horse is carrying a 500-pound gluttonous jockey. And this whole theory that you can, in fact, uh, improve your performance in this race of international economic competition by feeding the jockey and starving the horse is asinine. I don't know any other way to put it, but it's certainly counterproductive. And so what I would suggest to you is that the difficulties that, the, that have uh, belabored the American economy in the past, uh, dramatically in the past year, or year and a half, have first been born out of misguided public policy. Most importantly, two decades of too easy money. I asked myself when I looked at the, uh, the bubble burst on housing, how could so many people make so many bad decisions, irresponsible and uh, uh, counterproductive decisions. It's hard to imagine that. Uh, I saw my response was, well, when was the last time I did something foolish with money was the last time I had too much easy money. And so what we had was a period where the government created this enormous housing bubble, uh, maybe for the best of misguided intentions, but still nevertheless it was a product of a bad public policy. Market could have corrected that as it did the dot com crisis just a few years earlier, if left alone. But the government said, "Look, if we, if we have too much of a bad, uh, too much of a good thing, the best best way to improve on it is to have more of a uh, of too much of a good thing." And so we had uh, first the Bush stimulus package, which was a failure, then the high drama of the Bush. Uh, bailout, which was not only a failure, but very offensive failure to the uh, constituency of voting uh, or citizenry at large. And then that was followed on this enormous uh, uh, package uh, that is the current stimulus package. Now, there was one innovation in this recent effort that I find interesting. And that is the idea that we can track this money and make a direct uh, uh, tractability uh, recording of the jobs. Uh, my own view is this effort is by and large becoming clearly seen as empirically a bogus effort that is from its conception and in its administration only politically defined. And finally, two observations on that one. Politics is morally and intellectually inferior to virtually everything with the possible exception of sociology. Uh, and so if you, in fact, are making decisions out of a politically defined motive and you're letting your politics define your economics, you're probably going to come up with a bad notion. And just to be sure, uh, fair, because in my, my testimony I, I quote so many of the correct thinking economists like Hayek and Mises and so forth, let me just end with a quote from, uh, from John Kenneth Galbraith uh, re related to this tracking exercise that is, frankly, comical comicable at best. Uh, Galbraith said, beware of politicians that manufacture numbers for the sake of testimony. I think he got a perfect example of what it is uh, that uh, he warned us against at that time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Army. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Irons. Uh, th thank you for the opportunity today. Um, and I should warn you that I'm an economist who has manufactured numbers for the purpose of this testimony. Um, hopefully my manufactured numbers are not made up, but actually good estimates. Um, but let me, let me uh, um, start off by saying that there can be no accountability without transparency. And I applaud the efforts of this committee and the Congress and the administration to take, uh, to take transparency seriously. 
My testimony today will focus primarily on jobs. I want to make four main points. Uh, these points are elaborated in my written testimony, but let me cover the basics here. First, as you've already heard, the recipient reports displayed on recovery.gov are not perfect. This should not be a surprise given the short time frame in which the system was implemented, given the sheer number of reports, and given the problems inherent in this kind of endeavor. To err is indeed human. Nevertheless, errors and inconsistencies are unacceptable and should be addressed whenever they are found. Second, while many of the media have highlighted cases in which jobs have been overstated by recipients, the underreporting appears to be at least as significant of a problem as overreporting. My written testimony has more detail on the kinds of problems, but let me highlight a couple examples. Uh, first, there are a number of cases in which the prime recipients do not appear to have correctly estimated saved jobs. One grant recipient stated, and I quote, there were a number of jobs held by construction workers that were lengthened because of the funding, and they reported zero jobs. This is a case where clearly they had jobs that were retained because of the Recovery Act, yet they reported zero. In many cases, subcontractors and subawardees are not required to report on job creation. It is often unclear if these jobs are included by prime recipients. One recipient of a $2.5 million contract, of which 90 percent was awarded to subcontractors, stated, and again I quote, one full-time job was created with the prime contractor's organization as a result of this award. The job is titled project manager. Clearly this is the person who is in charge of managing the subcontractors. So for $2.5 million, they reported just one job created. They likely did not include the subcontractors. To give you a sense of the size of this potential problem, by my count there are 2,181 reports in which projects have been started and recipients received more than $50,000, yet they reported zero jobs in their report. There are 528 reports in which projects have been started, recipients received more than $1 million, yet fewer than two jobs were reported. So there may be legitimate explanations for these outliers, but we should not necessarily conclude that the 640,000 total as presented by recovery.gov is an overstatement of the recipient jobs and might very well be an understatement. My third point, uh, I want to stress that recipient reports, while providing valuable information on projects and employment, cannot and will not capture the full true impact of the Recovery Act. In fact, the true impact of the Recovery Act will be far greater than the sum total of the recipient reports. For example, the data only include contracts, grants, and loans. Tax benefits and entitlements are not included. Of the funds paid out so far, only about $52 billion, just one-fourth of the total, is in the form of contracts, grants, and loans. Further and importantly, these recipient reports only include direct jobs. For example, a new construction worker to hire to, to, hire to install a new roof will be included. The data does not include the job impact of construction workers respending on car repairs or restaurant dining. The data does not also include upstream supplier jobs at the companies that manufacture, transport, and sell roofing supplies at the wholesale or resale level. My fourth and last point, despite the problems with individual reports, it appears that the recipient report totals are consistent with accounts of economic advisors' job estimates and with other macroeconomic data and estimates. The economic evidence clearly shows that the Recovery Act is having an impact. Before the Recovery Act, employment was declining at an average monthly pace of over 500,000 jobs per month in the fourth quarter of 2008, and by nearly 700,000 jobs a month in the first three months of this year. The economy was in very much in free fall. In the most recent three-month period, employment declines have averaged fewer than 200,000 jobs. Before the Recovery Act, GDP was declining at a rapid rate. In the nine-month period ending in March this year, we saw the most rapid decline in GDP since quarterly data was first collected, going all the way back to 1947. So we had the most rapidly deteriorating economy in over 60 years. The most recent data shows a turnaround. GDP grew at a 3.5 percent annual rate in the most recent quarter. Now using a methodology more suited to capture the full impact of the Recovery Act, including tax cuts, aid to states, and direct investments, and also including respending and upstream supplier jobs, the total number of jobs created or saved so far is likely between one and one and a half million jobs. This estimate is approximately consistent with the CEA's initial estimate in May of 1.5 million in the fourth quarter of 2009. Other forecasters, including Goldman Sachs, Macroeconomic Advisors, Moody's Economy.com, and others, have estimated GDP and employment impacts consistent with these estimates as well. Uh, these macro estimates are also consistent with the micro, micro data 
from recovery.gov recipient reports. In summary, it does appear that the Recovery Act is on track. Evidence from macro level data to model estimates to recovery.gov recipient reports all point to a significant impact on jobs in the broader economy. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, let me thank both of you for your testimony. And let me begin by um, uh, asking um, a question uh, of both of you. The Recovery Act, um, what is your impression of it? My impression of the Recovery Act was that uh, it was a wholly futile effort. If you take a look in, uh, in my adult lifetimes, all the years that I've spent watching and studying on economic policy, what has worked to spur growth in recovery in the economy is cutting taxes and leaving the taxpayers who earn the money uh, actually become more investment. One of the things that, uh, and some, we have some very grievous institutional uh, dislocations in, in this fundamental structure of, of so much public policy. Uh, and we start with the tax code. If you go way back to Adam Smith's 1776 Wealth of Nation, he says the road to economic growth is uh, abstinence, uh, savings, and investment. Uh, savings and investment are two economic activities that are double taxed, so they've given a double whammy disincentive uh, to savers and investment. Every smart tax reduction we've ever made, that is tax reduction aimed at diminishing the load on savers and investors of this activity has caused them to be more active and gener generated the economy. If in fact the, the uh, federal government by size and the magnitude of spending is already redundant with even the interest on the national debt at that time being equal to the uh, entire budget of the Defense Department, uh, with uh, already existing current deficits of four, five hundred billion dollars to double down on what is redundant is, is not productive. Uh, let me share a broad impression. I'm afraid I don't have a, a good horse example, but let me use a, a different analogy. Um, before the Recovery Act was passed, the economy was in free fall. It, it, the economy had jumped out of a plane. It was declining at a very rapid rate. The recovery package was essentially a parachute, right? It opened up, it slowed the pace of decline. We still have jobs that are being lost, but they're being lost at a much slower pace. It gave the economy a chance to recover. Uh, it's not going to be the end and be all. It's not going to get us from where we are to a fantastic economy. No one's claiming that the economy that we're currently in is a great environment, but at least stopped the worst from happening. It stopped us from going off the cliff. Um, in terms of the policy, um, <clears throat> I tend to be more of a, I call it a kitchen sink economist. Um, I think we should try a little bit of everything. And I think in the recovery package, you saw that there was a number of investments. There was aid to states. There were tax cuts as part of the package. And I think that a problem of the size that we had demanded a comprehensive, broad-based solution. I think that's what the recovery package represented. So I'm very optimistic that this you know, gives the economy a chance to turn around. It stopped the downward spiral uh, and, and gave us a chance to recover. Um, on the tax cut component, um, I think there are components of the recovery package which um, I might not be as fond of as other parts, including some of the tax cuts. And I, I find it interesting that um, the Bush tax cuts were not listed as part of the success stories in terms of stimulus. In fact, we had the, uh, one of the worst recoveries on record uh, after the Bush tax cuts were passed. And so I think the record in most recent times of the efficacy of tax cuts as stimulus has been uh, at best mixed. Um, and I think we need to think about what kinds of tax cuts. Tax cuts are not a generic thing. There are tax cuts that I think for low and middle income Americans, which can be respent, can be very effective stimulus. Tax cuts um, for businesses who need customers, not tax cuts, uh, are in many ways probably not a good idea. Um, so I don't think we should talk about tax cuts in the abstract. We should have a more nuanced view. Dr. Irons, I'm deeply concerned that the unemployment rate has now surpassed 10 percent. Is this evidence that the Recovery Act is not working or that the projections of the Council of Economic Advisors that they were wrong? Uh, I don't think it is. I, I agree with you. I think the 10 percent unemployment rate is a huge problem. Um, I think the high unemployment rate is a result of a disastrous economy uh, that was in place before the Recovery Act was passed. And I think when you look at the projections of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, where they thought the economy would be, 
uh, they, along with private forecasters, uh, were, very, were overly optimistic about how high the unemployment rate would rise. So the fact that we have a 10 percent unemployment rate is a statement not about the recovery package, but is a statement about the state of the economy before the recovery package was passed. And in fact, if it were not for the recovery package, we'd have a much higher unemployment rate. So my example of the economy in free fall in a parachute, uh, it has slowed down the deceleration, but you still see some increase in the unemployment rate. At the same time, you don't want to cut yourself loose of that parachute. That would make things much worse. And that's the case we would be in if we did not have that parachute, if we did not have the Recovery Act in place. I yield to uh, the gentleman from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I got so many questions. I know where to start this group. Um, thank you for your uh, testimony, uh, Mr. Army. I uh, am curious. I know that in the in the previous testimony we heard earlier, uh, they were talking about all the jobs that have been created and saved. And uh, one of my concerns is the two thirds of jobs happen to be with the Department of Education. They've created 400,000 out of the uh, 640,000 jobs, and. In the testimony, it appears that all they did was make sure that the teachers' budgets or the education budgets are funded for another year, which means what are we going to do next year? And so it doesn't look like we've created or saved a permanent job because we haven't fixed an economic problem that will allow that job to continue unless we continue to find another stimulus that primes the pump again. What's well, your analysis of that? My own view is that, first of all, there's been very little distribution of this uh, massive amount of money that shocked the world. Uh, but it, by and large, it's been distributed intra-governmentally. So you're getting some public jobs that are perhaps being retained that might not otherwise have been, but they're, uh, uh, I, I certainly not think constitutes a, a, a recovery. What, uh, the thing that gives you recovery is when the private sector investor class engages. That's what happened in the aftermath of the Reagan taxes. And you're correct. I did, uh, did not mention the Bush tax cuts. We got an anemic recovery out of them because there was so much income redistribution in that package of tax cuts as opposed to st a stimulation for investment and savings. It was that was a tax cut package that was too politically defined to be as effective as it might otherwise have been. And I, I, I made the point earlier, you need smart tax cuts. If they're just income redistributional tax cuts, they, they do you very little good. So the fact of the matter is you have uh, some demonstration of direct linkage between uh, jobs in the government sector with intergovernmental uh, 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 awards but a more than discouraging dramatic demonstration of declining employment in the private sector that gives you the 10 percent overall reduction in employment or unemployment rate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I sit on the Small Business Committee and uh, it takes about 67,000 jobs according to the testimony we've heard a number of times to create a job for small business. Yet the average in this package is about $246,000 that's created so far. Um, I know that in this this package, there was $31 billion roughly of small business tax credits and things like that. Um, do you know off the top of your head, uh, Mr. Irons, how many jobs were created or saved uh, as a result of those tax credits? No, I don't. Uh, I, but again, let me just say, there's a generic uh, rule of thumb I think you can imply that public sector job creation is very costly and results in virtually no enhanced right. productivity for the economy as a whole. Private sector job creation uh, coming from the investment sector where in fact you expand the application of science and engineering through new, new capital investment increases productivity and in fact results in a, a much greater as it were bang for your buck in terms of the productivity gains that result in increased sustainability of the jobs. That's why you see a greater permanence in the jobs uh, created on the private sector. Um, also, with regards to uh, you know, this, this stimulus package, is, is, we're incurring a huge amount of debt. Mr. Irons, Dr. Irons, uh, what do you feel is an adequate level of debt for our economy to be able to, to, uh, to live with? Oh, that's a good question, and, and that's, I don't think it's a knowable question. Um, there's no specific number where if you're below it, you're fine. If you're above it, you're in trouble. I um, mean a half a billion dollars or half a trillion dollars worth of interest is something we can continue to sustain forever? The, the question is what is a sustainable level? I think that is the key question. And I think there you have to look at the, how fast the economy grows and then how fast the deficit increases the, the debt. 
And I think if you are underneath a threshold which keeps the debt from rising as a share of the economy, you are in okay territory. If the debt is rising faster than the economy as a whole, then you are in, in trouble. Um, the way I describe it is, uh, you know, Bill Gates can carry a bigger debt than, than I can uh, because of his income. And so long as our GDP is rising, we can continue to well, maintain higher levels not, of debt. Our GDP is not doing very well right now. That is my question. Where do you think we need to go? Are we, I, are we maxed out? Do we need to stop borrowing I, money? I, I don't think we are maxed out. I think we can still borrow money. We can money. still borrow more money. With, with the caveat, we can absolutely still borrow money. Thank uh, with you, the caveat uh, that the Mr. Army, before I run out of my time, I apologize, but I, I'm, my time is limited. Mr. Well, Army, of course, I like the answer. market will, finally, the market reveals everything eventually. One, one of the, uh, I think, uh, what is it they say, canaries in the mind that I'm looking at right now is the activity of the, uh, of the carry trade. These bet on currencies. Mm -hmm. They used to, they, for, for years recently, they were betting against the Japanese currency, correctly so. Now they're betting against the United States currency because we are flooding the world with dollars and there's a decreasing willingness on the part of the world to, uh, to own our debt. And uh, the fact is, the government acquires money in three ways. They tax it directly or they borrow it. In a declining world willingness to do so, they end up printing it. If they print it, then they tax indirectly by uh, deflating uh, uh, or inflating the currency, deflating its purchasing power, and, and it comes back. It's in any, almost every case, the cost of current uh, mismanaged fiscal policy falls on a future generation. Thank you for your testimony. Neil back my time. Thank you very much. Um, I now yield to the gentleman who at one point chaired this committee for six years, Mr. Burton from Indiana. And I look so young. <clears throat> In the picture. In the knock it off. Put that down. You know, uh, the President has said and his administration has said they created 640,329 jobs. That is pretty specific. You would think they would be able to account for those jobs since they are so specific down to the axial job. I mean, 329? How do you account for that? Uh, well, I think the number that is presented is I know, the, but do you think that they can really be that accurate? To it write it down is, to uh, no, it is a number actually 640,329? No. There Something are, there are errors on, on, on different things. Absolutely not. The administration did not pull this out of their heads. This is the sum total of the recipient reports. Okay. Right? So, so these are what the recipients report and they added that up. Well, Where did you go to school? Uh, graduate school, MIT. And before that, Swarthmore? Swarthmore College, yes. Yeah. That's right. How old are you? Uh, that's a good question. What, what year is it? Uh, 39. 39? Yeah. See, in 1982, where were you? How old would you have been in 1982? It would be 12. 12. Well, in 1982, I became a congressman, and I don't think you were here, Dick, but uh, we had a guy that came into the White House, and uh, we'd come out of the Carter administration with 14% uh, inflation, 12% unemployment, he called it a misery index, 26%, and they were throwing money at everything. He put on a sweater and said we had to turn our thermostats down, and the world was going to hell in a handbasket. And this guy comes riding in from the West and he said, and they said, you've got to raise taxes. We've got to get more money in the Treasury because everything is going south. And you know what he said? He said, well, I think that uh, we ought to cut taxes, give people and business more disposable income to invest, and that ought to spur economic growth. And you know what? He was right. We had 25 years of economic expansion or 20-some years of economic expansion. And this philosophy that you can spend yourself out of debt and solve the economic problems by spending, to me, is just anathema. I, I, just, I just can't get it. And when I hear people say, well, you've spent $1.4 trillion more this year than you've taken in, but we can spend more and get out of debt, I think you've got to be smoking something that's illegal. You know, this is crazy. The, the, the health bill we're talking about is going to cost at least another trillion dollars over the next decade. It's going to raise taxes of probably uh, God only knows how much. We're already $1.4 trillion in the tank right now, and there's going to be more spending. They want to come up with more programs that's going to cost money in taxes, like the cap and trade. You can't spend your way out of the hole. When you get so deep, you've got to stop digging. And that's the problem we have right now. I'm putting this in very simple economic terms. We need to cut spending. 
There's a book I wish you would read, Mr. Irons. It's called The Forgotten Man. Have you ever heard of that book? No, I haven't. Well, you being an intellectual, I wish you'd read it. It's a book that uh, goes uh, from 1929 to 1941, and it tracks the Roosevelt administration and the things that they did to solve their economic problems. And they did almost the same thing you're talking about in the mid-1930s. And you know what happened? Things got worse. And it wasn't until the war started that they dug themselves out of that hole because everybody had to go to back to work, women and everybody else, because they were fighting overseas. The only reason I bring all this up is, you know, I I've been here for 27 years, and some people say, well, that's too long. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I have to tell you this. One thing I do know is that you can't spend more than you take in. Inevitably, it's going to come back and bite you in the rear end. And that's where we're going right now. And this idea, and I heard you, I think I heard you say that we're in a position now where we could spend more money to get the economy moving and that sort of thing. I think, Mr. Irons, that you're incorrect. And uh, I hope you'll read that book. And maybe the next time I see you, you'll have a different uh, perspective on uh, the way we spend money in this country. And with that, Dick, it sure is good seeing you, buddy. I wish you were still here. <laughs> Thank you. And still majority leader, I would say. And still majority leader. Now, now, now you're going too far. You're dreaming. Stanley um, Hoyer, I'm sure Stanley Hoyer uh, would have uh, a different uh, view uh, of the matter. <laughs> Let me uh, recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, both the gentlemen, for being here. And uh, Dr. Irons, I didn't know when it became a bad thing to know, s know stuff. Uh, and I think Dr. Army would agree, uh, Mr. Army would agree that uh, uh, a little knowledge sometimes is a good thing, and having, uh, having the facts is a good thing. And I would point out that, uh, yes, in World War II, we pulled ourselves out of a recession. It was one of the greatest examples of big government investment, and the U.S. debt uh, was at extremely high levels during World War II. And that was, you know, I think most economists would tell you that that, that had a big part of about pulling us out of, um, out of the recession and depression at, at that time. Mr. Army, do you, do you support uh, unemployment compensation during times like this? Well, obviously, we, we always like to help people who are truly distressed. There's always a question of what definition you give to that. And again, like almost everything I can think of, even uh, unemployment compensation, which can be, in fact, a good and necessary thing, can be carried to extreme. If it right. becomes uh, a, a fountainhead for dependence. Uh, let, let me, just, that, just so we're on the same track, I understand where you're going. Let me, let me rephrase the question. Uh, do you agree that uh, for people who are out of work through no fault of their own and are continuing to look for a job in the economy and can't find one through no fault of their own, that they should receive unemployment compensation? I don't believe that the best public policy option is to make them less miserable in their continued unemployment for a longer period of time as opposed to those that policies that can be directly pursued right. that will give them the job opportunity. One of the things that frustrates me as I look at this past year and a half in the United States with public policy is the opportunities to expand employment opportunities for real people in the private sector that have been foregone. Uh, and uh, the problem is office holders also always uh, uh, oftentimes tend to pacify their own feelings of inadequacy by saying, well, at least we made them more comfortable in their misery. Let and me ask I don't you find this that way, Mr. Army, would you have voted option? for the unemployment compensation packages uh, that were in the economic recovery bill and that have the House has passed since then? I can't remember. I'm sorry. Would we, we, I have? We passed, we passed, we passed unemployment I compensation. I probably would have. I, I, I may very reluctantly have voted for them while I argued we ought to be doing something more productive, more responsible, uh, with a greater heart and a greater okay. sense of dignity and future uh, for these folks. You would, have, you, would have voted, you would have voted yes? I just want to make it I clear. Don't I, I, you don't I don't know. I haven't looked at the package. Right. I didn't look at the package. I never voted on how, something I didn't how, read. How, how, about like, the, how about the tax uh, reduction components of the economic recovery bill? If there were any tax co reduction components that were not merely income redistributional and I could possibly assess as to ha have something to engage savers and investors in more of that activity, which would re result in job creation, well, me, I would have been supportive Let me ask of you this. You keep saying if there were. Did you read the economic recovery bill? 
No, I didn't. Did. I had no reason to read it. I wasn't well, no, uh, no, going I, to Mr. vote Mr. on it. Mr. Mr. Army, you've been, you've been commenting an awful lot, both here and in the press, about the economic right. recovery bill. Uh, we ask members of Congress to read right. it when they vote on it and are considering right. it. You've, you've said a lot about it, right. so I, I'm a little surprised to learn that you haven't Well, look, uh, read if, it, if but, my neighbor's but, got a dead cat stinking up his yard, I don't know, have to know how it got there to know it's a dead cat stinking up the yard. What's that? Well, I, I think it's important <laughs> to, to read things. I, I understand there's some comments suggesting that knowing stuff is a bad thing, uh, but uh, it seems to me that we owe it to the people that we're communicating with, that we, we have an understanding to read uh, the information. Let me, let, me, let me ask you this, because it's not clear yet whether you're for the unemployment compensation components uh, or whether you are, uh, would have supported the tax cut components. Both of those were significant components, by the way, of the economic recovery bill. Dr. Irons, can you talk to a little bit to, to that fact? The economic recovery bill that we've been talking about today uh, represents less than a third of uh, what was in there for economic uh, impact. Uh, could you comment a little bit on that, please? Yeah, that's right. The, the specific elements that have been uh, reported on through the recovery.gov recipient reports represent, uh, will represent about a third of the total amount that's in the package. Right now, they're about a quarter because they've gone out a little more slowly than the tax cuts, the assistance to the states, and some of the other components. Uh, so tax cuts are a significant part. The assistance for states is a significant part. And the direct investments, which largely show up, uh, in the reports we've been talking about today are a significant part, uh, about equal weight to each. So the numbers that we've seen today are only a part of the overall impact. Okay. Could you, could you comment a little bit on the situation that the President inherited with respect to the uh, deficit and debt uh, following the last uh, administration? Yeah, the, the deficit, which is now you know, well over a trillion dollars, is largely the result of policies that were put in place before the President took office, uh, as well as the deteriorating economy. Um, the economic deterioration, which was, uh, as I said before, the most rapid since 1947, is the prime culprit in terms of the reduction in revenues and the increase in, in outlays uh, that have resulted um, from just the economy going down. That's been the prime driver of the higher deficit. And so in thinking about how you solve a deficit problem, the number one priority is to get the economy moving again. And that we can't solve the deficit problem if we have a recession that's going to last for five years or ten years. That needs to be the number one priority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, now I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Did you, did, did yeah, ranking member one? The gentleman, you yield yeah, for just a moment. Seconds. Mr. Army, since you didn't have a chance to read that entire document, let me assure you that those of us who had a chance to read it, not in the few hours between the air dropping at midnight and the vote, but, but afterwards, no, there were no uh, non-redistribution uh, tax cuts, and the tax cuts that are in there were de minimis to uh, in the investor class in any way, shape, or form, unless you include the green jobs. I yield back and thank the gentleman. You know, I, um, uh, the I gentleman, you, I it's on the gentleman's fine. time. I must admit, yeah. But, I, Mr. Chairman, I'll give me I, plenty I, of extra if I need to, it's just you know, not you true. You definitely get it. You know, I just think this is a little strange, though, um, knowing the kind of technical person that you were when you provided leadership here, that you provide leadership for an organization that's totally against the bill and you haven't read it. But anyway, that's another guy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Irons, in one of your earlier statements, you said that uh, the recovery package, and I quote, was kind of try a little bit of everything. Is that right? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the exact wording, but it's yeah. It close. Seems, I mean, it seems to me what, what a mischaracterization. I mean, I, I would argue what this government has done, and frankly goes back to the previous administration as well, is not try a little bit of everything. We've tried a lot of one thing, big government spending. I mean, think about it. The bailout package last fall, the stimulus package, the, but, uh, the appropriations process that, that has moved forward, we're spending at 12, 14 percent increases. I mean, all we've done, I've argued many times, if big spending was going to get us out of this mess, we should have been out of it a long time ago. That's all the government's been doing. So to characterize it as we've tried a lot of everything or a little bit of everything is just, just totally, totally wrong. But here's where I want to focus with both of you guys. I want your response to this. Uh, thinking now in a, in a in a big picture sense. Two questions. Are you troubled, either one of you, are you troubled by what I would characterize as an unprecedented involvement of the government in the private sector? And let's go specifically to, to all the spending we know, but how about this fact, which just when I think about this in the United States of America, we now have a federal government pay czar telling private American citizens how much money they can make. And I understand it's done in the, in the context of the TARP repayment plan. But think about that, what's going on 
in the, in the framework of Senator Schumer saying, maybe we need to look at the idea of, of uh, any publicly traded company, Mr. Feinberg has jurisdiction over executives and their pay compensation. So are you troubled by where this administration seems to, seems to want to take this economy? And I'll start quickly with Mr. Army and then with uh, well, Mr. Well, first of all, yes, I'm troubled because uh, I, on our first basis, on the basis of individual liberty. Uh, those of us who believe in personal freedom, and especially freedom of enterprise, and we witnessed the world's uh, great success story through private individual enterprise, understand that when the government tries to manage, as they've tried in many other countries, they eventually get it wrong. Secondly, and, pro and more pragmatically, uh, there's a, an incentive effect. In fact, uh, you know, you can go all the way back to Shakespeare or you can jump forward to Thomas Alva Edison. Their point was, it's not worth uh, writing, it's not worth inventing unless it can be sold for a profit. There is no greater, more productive motive in the history of the world that is that is contributed to human well-being greater by greater amounts and done less to negatively affect human well-being and the profit motive. And if the government's going to, in fact, say, look, we will confiscate your salaries, your, your, your earnings, and so forth, you disincentivize people from being productive. Thank you. Dr. Irons, quickly. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not a quick answer, unfortunately. It's a big question. Um, the government is, be, is involved in a number of different the areas. The question was, are you troubled by the unprecedented level of government involvement in the private sector? Well, I sector? think you have to be more specific than that. I mean, there are areas where the but government should be involved. But you can answer yes or no if you're troubled. Uh, I, I am not troubled by some, and I am troubled by others. Okay. Uh, I would much rather the government be out of the banking business, out of the car business. Um, I think that once you are in it at the behest of banks, in the case of TARP, you need to do what you have to do to manage that effectively, be it a PAYSAR, be it oversight, reasonable oversight over the business practices of assets that you own. I think that is reasonable. I would like the government to be out of the banking sector. Let me, let so me frame the question. Bits and pieces. Let me frame the question in a slightly different manner. Would you... Would you um, I would argue that one of the things holding us back from coming out of this recession with the type of job growth we'd all like to see is business people are smart people. They take educated risks. They don't take crazy risks. And so they're asking themselves, you know, I'd like to bring those people back I laid off. I'd like to do that expansion that we were thinking about doing. But I don't know what these yahoos in Congress are going to do next. I don't know if they're going to pass this health care proposal, which raises my tax. I don't know if they're going to pass this cap and trade, which is going to cost me more in energy costs. Would you argue that the uncertainty and, uh, of the policies being promote, uh, promoted, policies being advanced, is hindering the ability to create jobs, whether they get done or not? Uh, and let's go quickly with Dr. Irons and then do uh, Dr. Army. Uh, I think uncertainty is not good for the private sector. Whether or not these are major uncertainties in the life of a business person, I don't, I don't think so. I think a lot of this is on your head. You can pass health care and remove that uncertainty. Uh, I think that we can, we can get rid of the uncertainty. We can add a big tax if we do it, right? Well, I, I think I think that certainty is better, and the more we can forecast what we're going to do, what you're going to do, I agree that that is a good way to go. Dr. Army, quickly. There's, there's no doubt about it. The uncertainty uh, kept the investor class on the sidelines throughout all of the '70s, uh, and uh, they're sitting it out right now. Uh, uh, specifically, with what they see as the targeted industries of the big government ambitions of this administration. Mr. Chairman, if I could, since you, you took a little bit of my, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Chairman, one last question on, on, on the debt. We're at $12 trillion. We're, sl we're slated to go to $20 trillion over the next decade. I mean, this, this, this scares me to death. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who offered a balanced budget this, this past spring. I actually tried to cut some spending and get, get some sanity back in our government. Gen Think gentlemen. about what it takes yeah. to balance this, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Give me just 30 seconds. To balance this, we first have to get to zero. Then we got to run a trillion dollar surplus, I mean, to, to ever get to balance. So how serious, I mean, to me, this seems like the, the most serious thing, one of the most serious things facing our government, our country. How serious is it, uh, Dr. Irons? Uh, I think it's important to maintain a level of deficit and debt that is sustainable. Do we need to get exactly to zero? I don't think there's any economist who's going to say there's something magic about a zero balance. Um, I think if you feel it's important to keep your books in balance, that's one thing from an economic perspective. You can absolutely maintain permanent deficits, a permanent debt, so long as you maintain the sustainability of the loan. I understand. Jim. And now I'll call on the gentleman Thank you, from, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, call on the gentleman from uh, Louisiana, Mr. Gao. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I, um, Dr. Army, I was reading through some of your background, um, and it says here that um, 
when I was a professor, so I would assume that you taught uh, at a university level. And um, if you don't mind me asking, what was your salary teaching economics at the university? <laughs> well, I, I, I left teaching in 1985 uh, or 84. I was teaching both summer terms, and I, my salary was uh, $35,000 at that time. And it was a, a curious case in my point. I was one of the few people I knew that was qualified by way of uh, a comparable employment uh, to actually leave my employment and go to Washington in Congress and double my salary. Very few, very, very few people could do that. Uh, college professors could. Uh, so the, the, the pay isn't always all that good. Uh, uh, but still, you know, somebody's going to pay you to do nothing but what you enjoy doing. It's not a bad well, life. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your answer. And the reason why I, uh, I asked the question was uh, previously I questioned uh, S Deputy Secretary Miller on the amount of jobs created uh, in connection with the amount of money actually spent. Uh, according to the numbers that Mr. Miller presented, the Department of Education has spent $67 billion in order to create approximately 400,000 jobs. And based on the numbers uh, that he presented, uh, I calculated that pr on, on, on the average it would cost $167,500 to create one educational related job. And my question to you, uh, Dr. Army, is this. Based on the average salary that Mr. Miller stated as about $70,000 per educator, uh, which leaves about $100,000 $100, remaining to be spent on what have you. How, how can your or organization, uh, I, I see that you here, you are, you are in charge of Freedom Works. In what ways can the private sector or, or your organi organization improve on the efficiency of jobs creation? Well, it's very hard to improve on the efficiency of the government because cost efficiency is no part of their incentive structure. Uh, so what happens when you, when you uh, when you devote yourself to uh, sustaining employment in the public sector, you also sustain a very high, costly, oftentimes not very productive uh, uh, superstructure, uh, a support structure. And of course, it's not a college professor I know of that isn't aware that the college spends too much time and money sustaining redundant administrative positions, all of which have to be supported in order to, to support the faculty. The private sector is much more efficient. That is to say, it costs less money to sustain a job, and because that job, more often than not, is of greater productivity, has a return to it, and they are incentivized to hold down overhead costs. Based on your experience uh, as an educator, as well as being um, a majority leader, um, in your uh, professional opinion, how would the Department of Education better uh, spend its um, stimulus money in order to create jobs? Well, again, it's very difficult for me to envision very many ways in which government can spend money and, and enhance production, output, growth in uh, total output, productivity. Governments are just frankly not very efficient in their use of people's money and uh, so if in fact you t rather than taxing more money either for me or my grandchildren to put more money in the hands of of government agencies and bureaucrats to spend inefficiently now for a very little gain in a well-being for the community leave the money in my hands i'll invest it wisely we'll have capital expansion you remember the uh, uh, there was a, a great theory of uh, business cycles called the innovation cycle advanced by Joseph Schumpeter, and I remember uh, John Kenneth Galbraith criticizing because we've seen it all. There will never be another great invention. But look at uh, in, the, in the 80s when the investors got in class, all that invention, all that creativity of the 60s and the 70s and the electronic sector of the economy just burst on the scene. So now we have all kinds of careers, jobs, opportunities for further employment and enhancement in the private side in product lines that didn't even exist in 1980. Thank you, Nayib, about my time. 
I now yield to the gentleman, ranking member from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I could have the slide put up with the majority statement here. I have underlined a portion that says, on October 30, 2009, the Recovery, Accountability and Transparency Board, Recovery Board, released a consolidated account of those reports showing the Recovery Act funds have directly created or saved 640,329 jobs. Uh, that has been disputed here today. Mr. Army, if I asked you to calculate what uh, uh, $1.73 billion would, uh, would promote in the way of jobs if you gave it to the government, would you be able to do it that accurately? Well, I'd have to, first of all, I'd have to brush up my shakes here. We'll probably get in touch with the Department of Labor Statistics, one of the really reliably honest uh, agencies of the Federal Government. Uh, probably rely also a little bit on some of the information I could get well, from let the me, General let me ask you, Office. Let me ask you a, 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 a one that you don't have to brush up on, which goes to the core of your economics training and, and, and theory. Uh, if we accept those figures, even though the earlier panel said it is plus or minus a whole bunch, there is inaccuracies and so on, if we accept those figures, then if we took fiscal year 2010, Mr. Obama's fiscal year, where we are going to spend $3.552 billion, just call it $3.5 trillion, I am sorry, $3,552 billion, $3.5 trillion. And using the same ratio, my whiz kids in the back came up with 13,145,253 jobs. So if we continue at that rate, that means that the Federal Government, which employs about 3 million people directly, can spend $13 million on Medicare, Medicaid, every social program, everything, we can save 13 million jobs with our current spending. And if we double the spending, we could nearly, nearly wipe out the 15 million unemployed. So is Dr. Irons and Dr. Army, but first Dr. Irons, is it logical to simply spend $3.5 trillion more dollars every year in order to get unemployment down? Or is, in fact, the Keynesian concept simply unsustainable, that government jobs are like feeding somebody fish for a day, you spend the $3.5 trillion, you keep people on the government payola hanging around blue rooms waiting for something to do, and then at the end, and not eliminating any inefficiencies, and then at the end of the year, the $3.5 trillion is spent, and you've got to spend it the next year if you want to keep those people off unemployment. Isn't that true, Dr. Irons? I think you are mixing apples and oranges to a great extent. With okay. The Dr. Army, I, I understand you know about apples uh, and oranges. I think what you have to first I go back to my initial observation. A very large portion of the existing expenditure and employment structure of the current Federal Government is redundant. So the fact of the matter, or even for that matter, counterproductive. So if you add to that, you just add to the burden. So and more, more course, rocks in a knapsack of somebody who can't carry a 100 pound pack is not going absolutely. to get it any better. Let me ask yeah. you about the hangover. Dr. Army, if we were to spend the $3.5 trillion additional dollars that those who say more government will take care of unemployment, don't we have an inevitable hangover where the debt burden, in other words, the amount of money that goes out just to pay to the Chinese for what we owe them, in fact mortgages the future of government decisions? In other words, it creates a permanent overhead that you can't get past even if you reduce the size of government. Well, we are we're already there. If we were to meet our current obligations in Medicare uh, and Social Security, we would pretty well consume the existing current federal budget. Again, the problem still remains. The government cannot get money unless they print it, unless they directly take it away from somebody else. People are not willing to, to buy our notes and, right. and lend us well, money Doc, and Dr. we Army, burden our children with the taxes. Dr. Army, uh, obviously spending 167000 for each job, and it is only a job for one year, it is one year full time equivalent, mm -hmm. could be compared to the private sector. Can you imagine your wildest dreams, somebody saying, if you loan, if you give me 167000 all I can do is create one job for one year. Can you imagine an investor uh, being asked to do that? Wouldn't it typically be that if you invest, let's say, $1.6 uh, in other words, 10 times that figure, 
I will create 10 jobs in perpetuity. Isn't that the normal business model, something along that line of about 10 jobs per million that are permanently created in the private sector? Well, that's right, because the private sector produces a product that people want, and there's a productivity enhancement that, that generally comes from expanding your capital stock and applying new science and engineering. But there's repeat sales. The fact of the matter is uh, the government doesn't produce anything. Last, because my time has expired, the old a axiom that if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, and if you teach him how to fish, he'll, f he'll feed his family for a lifetime. Isn't this stimulus simply fish for government employees for one year, even if you accept the figures given to us today? My own view is, again, we've, we start with an already uh, existing redundant sec uh, capacity in the federal government. So it is, in fact, it's, it's basically spending our money on their own operation, which uh, leads to no enhancement in the overall well-being, productivity, uh, productive capability of the economy. So that's like, you know, you're taking the... Uh, you're taking the groom's meals away to buy, uh, or the horse's oats away from him to buy more steak sandwiches for the groom. Yeah. So just the gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Drehaus. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I wasn't here for the entire presentation. I was in another committee, but it seems as if we've gone from defining propaganda to engaging uh, in propaganda in, in some of what we're doing here. Uh, Dr. Irons, could, could you help us? Uh, do you believe that the, uh, the estimates, and, and we're only talking about a small portion of the stimulus uh, in terms of job creation, the estimates of 640,000 jobs, even if the statistics aren't exactly specific, do you believe they're close to being accurate? Yeah, I think they're ballpark. As I said in my testimony, uh, the errors have been brought up and the mistakes. There are some that would underestimate the number of jobs and some that overestimate. So as a ballpark matter, I think we're getting ballpark right numbers. Okay. Uh, and, and Mr. Army, um, I, I, I find the, the conversation that was just engaged in very curious. This, this notion that we're spending $167,000 per job and, and that job being a, a temporary thing. It, when you create a bridge and, and you hire somebody to build a bridge, it, does the bridge have value in and of itself? I'm sorry, do what? When you build a bridge and hire someone to build that bridge, does the bridge have value? Well, assuming that the bridge is a bridge to somewhere, yes, it would. And of course, I mean, it's it, probably we, we the greatest in observation in economic development theory is uh, sound public capital increases the productivity of the private sector. And, and if you're and building a bridge, it, Mr. Army, if you're building a bridge, I assume that the iron that's coming for that bridge uh, is coming from an, an iron factory. I'm, I'm assuming that the tools that are used to create the bridge, I, I'm assuming that the cranes coming to create the bridge are coming from the private sector. I, I also assume that the engineering studies and, and the architecture studies, those are private sector jobs, are they not? Well, yes, certainly so. And, if, and so uh, the one you, job you, that might be created to build the bridge or the multiple jobs that might be used to, right. to build the bridge are actually having a, a ripple effect in the economy in that the private sector is benefiting quite tremendously, just using this scenario, in that the, the supplies for the bridge are coming from the private sector, the, the tools being used to build the bridge are coming from the private sector, the engineering studies are coming from the private sector, the architecture studies right. are coming from the private So, So is it a misrepresentation that, that the gentleman has made that one job that costs $167,000, that it's really only that one job well, and that it's only temporary? First of all, you have to be very careful when you recognize if in order to get the money to build the bridge, you take it away from me. I might have bought something and there would have been the same uh, Do you have the capacity to build a bridge? Do you have the capacity to build a bridge for a tax cut? Look, I, if in fact there were any substantial documented portion of these funds that were going to real public capital uh, expenditures, I would be more encouraged by your argument. Well, there absolutely are. And, and I would point you to, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting that you bring this up, because the minority leader has suggested, and he's from the state of Ohio, that there had been no projects that were capital in nature invested in the state of Ohio. And then the next day, the, the governor's office and, and the Department of Transportation in the state of Ohio said, in fact, while we engage in this hyperbole all the time about no infrastructure dollars going in, they laid out a whole series 
of projects that have been invested in in infrastructure in the state of Ohio. So are those job creation efforts? If in fact they build real productive for public capital, you can go back to uh, Adam Smith. Yes, this is good uh, investment in the so it's creating the jobs. Community. But I would argue that in this last, and frankly, the uh, President Bush's as well, uh, there was very little expenditure of these big expansive funds uh, uh, allocated to real public capital structure, mostly to income redistributional uh, efforts like, uh, like tax rebates and things of this nature. So I guess in the memorable line of Shania Twain, I'd have to say that don't impress me much. Well, I would like to get back to, to, to this notion that these are, are one-year jobs. Um, are, are you familiar with, uh, you know, in the construction sector, jobs that continue ad infinitum? If you do a road project, if you build a house, uh, if you build a hotel, if you build a building in, in downtown Cincinnati, if you build a bridge, uh, do those do those jobs go on forever, or, or do, does it go project to project to project? And isn't the idea in, in investing in, in a project, in, in fact, to create that temporary employment to get them over that time when when the economy is slow? Well, of course, if you're talking about capital investment, you build your plant, you build your road, you build your bridge, and then on that, you have in, uh, ongoing produ production and, and productivity and expanding in the economy, if sure. it is a real capital structure. Like I said, there's a big difference in whether or not it's a bridge to somewhere as opposed to a bridge to nowhere. If it's a bridge to nowhere, then uh, there are no future employment opportunities that are pursuant to the bridge. Well, I wasn't in the Congress when they were building bridges to nowhere. Well, uh, I, I'm just I'm just in the Congress when when we're putting money in, into bridges, and and bridges that matter in, in Cincinnati and elsewhere. But this notion that these jobs, you know, because they they employ someone for a year and and that's how they're counted, somehow don't count, because a construction project apparently is supposed to last for years and years and years and years. Uh, well, I just don't understand that. And if you could help me with that, well, I'd appreciate all it. Right. There's a substantial difference in spending the money to build the bridge that enhances the, uh, the production of the community, the movement of goods and services, or a plant or a facility, as opposed to paying uh, for another year's salary for a redundant person on a faculty someplace. And gentlemen, in fact, if you're gentlemen. doing make work, and this was a, an argument that Gaines himself engaged in. Gaines argued that you could actually improve well-being by just having people dig holes and fill them back but, in. But I'm, I'm curious as to your, your Mr. Chairman, I would ask time. unanimous consent that gentlemen have more time to talk about this very small portion of the bill having very little to do about the earlier discussion. But I, as he wants to go on about the small amount of roads, even though there should have been a large amount of roads, <laughs> I'd ask you have another 30 I, I, seconds. I would just, I would just ask the, the witness one more time. You, you mentioned a redundant faculty member. Um, is it your belief that that the teachers that are being supported through this legislation are redundant faculty members? Let me, let me say very clearly about this. I was a professor for 20 years. I'm intimately familiar with what goes on in universities and educational facilities. And they are extremely inefficient at internal resource allocation. And yes, there are many, many redundant faculty uh, members. Now, the heartbreak of that is where you could expand the faculty members where there's a truly need, you are often blocked from doing so while you maintain the employability of the redundancy. So, so your experience so, as a university professor at a university allows you to suggest that the faculty members that are retaining employment through this legislation in K through 12 education across the country are redundant? Let me suggest you yeah. that, first you know, of all. I, I, I'm trying to be a, a generous and trying hard, <laughs> you know, but the gentleman's time has long expired. <laughs> and if he has any additional questions, may you put them in writing and then have the uh, Dr. Army to respond I, to them. Okay? I appreciate the chairman's indulgence. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, may I just conclude by pointing out, I believe my 20 years of experience in the university and in the administration of universities is a greater degree of experience than yours in building bridges. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, let me just say, that first of all, let me thank both witnesses, you know, for your testimony. And I think that, uh, of course, um, um, you've been very, very helpful. 
And I think Dr. Irons has pointed out that even though that a few mistakes were made, that when you look at the overall picture, that it probably balances out because some information did not go forward. So we really, you know, uh, when you look at the overall picture, it will balance out in terms of the actual amount of jobs that was created. The testimony we have heard today directly refutes the completely unsupported allegation of propaganda. It's not propaganda. Most of the witnesses agree that Recovery Act spending has created and saved hundreds of thousands of jobs. The 640,000 jobs that were reported as directly created or saved by just a portion of initial recovery spending validates estimates by the government and private forecasters that the Recovery Act is responsible for more than 1 million overall jobs so far. And of course, uh, that to me, uh, which includes jobs indirectly and created and jobs saved and uh, all these different categories that people are talking about here. The stimulus package put forward to help everyday working Americans is a far cry from propaganda. This is putting food on, on, on the table of many families. To the real people whose jobs were saved and to those who have found work, it represents food on the table and a roof over their heads. The real issue is that we need to get Recovery Act projects underway faster and we need to target them on economically distressed areas, the areas that really need it most. We need to make certain that we put it in there and make certain that jobs are created. Uh, at the same time, we need to continue our strict oversight of Recovery Act spending. The chairman of the Recovery Board testified that the Recovery Act contains the most extensive accountability and transparency provision that we have ever seen. We, we intend to ensure that we make the most of them. Finally, I understand that politics is involved in everything we do up here on Capitol Hill. I understand that. I have been here 27 years. But the issue of job creation is too important to play politics with and I refuse to play politics with it. We need to work together to get this economy back on its feet and get, them, get people back to work. Uh, this is serious, and I think that if we work together, we can do that. We need to make certain that we have some penalties involved with agencies and groups that are not reporting. We need to make certain that we get the legislation through that makes it possible for people to have funding uh, I think that it, now it's an unfunded mandate, and I think that we really should make certain that they're able to get accountants, that they're able to get administrative people, they're able to get folks in that will be in, in a position to get information into at, at, at a reasonable period of time and making certain that that information is accurate. And I think that uh, um, it makes it very, it's very important to do that. I think to ignore it and to just talk about, you know, this is not working and that's not working. And at the same time, people are suffering, and we cannot afford that luxury any longer. We have a job to do, and we need to do it. So I want to thank you, Dr. Army. I want to thank you, Dr. Irons. And Dr. Army, it's good to know that there's life after this place. Thank you very much. And on that note, I yield back, and the committee is now adjourned. You can watch this hearing online at cspan.org slash stimulus. That's our website that has other hearings, debates, and news conferences on the stimulus.